peanut brittle, but it was. In 23, we have the full complement of Washington County Commissioners, Commissioner and Vice Chair Roy Rogers, Commissioner Nafi Safai, myself, Chair Harrington, Commissioner Pam Treese, and Commissioner Jerry Willey. All righty, we're starting off with board and leadership communication. Um, and to give everyone a couple more minutes to get settled. I'm going to suggest that we look at the two draft letters first. Uh, the first one, the draft letter of support for Tanya Angie's candidacy for ICMA president. We've uh, had this. Thank you to Commissioner Treese for your authorship. Uh, so this is uh, of no surprise to us as commissioners. Uh, are there any questions, comments, uh, or otherwise on that letter? Well, oh, we went to, yeah, I, I mentioned uh, that I thought, in fact, I've talked to Tanya and as well as to Pam, that maybe a, uh, a couple of things could be added. It's a well-written letter. Uh, I told Pam I thought you did a really good job, but maybe something in the area of uh, Tanya has done a really outstanding job working with a budget that uh, is not uh, not uh, expanding to meet the needs of a population. So she's working under difficult financial uh, situation. I think that resonates with a lot of folks who say, but can you work with, you know, all organizations, their budgets are, are shrinking. And I think you said, Pam, that you thought that that would be mm -hmm. acceptable. The other thing is that, and I guess I subscribe to this personally myself, is that, uh, it, all organizations are having a, a great number of, of changes in personnel due to some say the silver tsunami, the others say it's just, you know, the way that the, the world is. And, and uh, Tony is, is capable uh, in working in organizations where there's a lot of uh, change in personnel and continuing to maintain the services and work uh, effectively with the government. So I just thought that might resonate with people around the country that they're saying, well, gee, she works with budgets. And, you know, are challenging. We all do that. And working with staff is changing. We all do that. So, just as a couple of suggestions. I mean, I actually, I, I, where you did talk to me, Commissioner Rogers, you did talk to me earlier about it. And uh, there is a spot after, uh, and while others are more specific to our county structure, which is this third line in the second paragraph, that I can add those in. So. Did you send that? Oh yeah. yeah, you got a copy of the letter, and it's in your. No, I got the original one, but I mean, I haven't. Case. I haven't. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I yeah, wanted yeah. to have this discussion. I maybe you did that over lunch. Everyone yeah. agreed. Um, I have no problem with those suggested changes. I would like the reminder as to the date by which this needs to be submitted. January 9th. That's the packet deadline that I need to get by. So that would be before our meeting next Tuesday in which case we would need to give our thumbs up today, or if you could get us an additional draft this Thursday for a final thumbs up, that would be great. We will do that. Did you have any additions or changes? Nope, nope. I was fine as is. No, I'm good. I thought it was a good letter too. I appreciate too. you doing that. Commissioner Fry? Thumbs up. Okay, great. Thank you. Thursday, okay. Hopefully and I would like remember. to thank- yeah. our... If you can't, that's fine. I just thought- Anything we can do to help her right. out. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Megan. Megan helped a lot on this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The second with regard to comments on the proposal and, uh, excuse me, comments on the purpose and need and proposed action for analysis of regional mobility pricing project under the National Environmental Project Act, NEPA. And I would, uh, in addition to calling our attention to that draft letter, I would also like to thank uh, Ms. Defabach for uh, sending us an email with further information about uh, tolling and variable price tolling and so forth. So we have an abundance of information. Um, I'll start. I think this is a really good letter. 
uh, and the various items that it speaks to. I appreciate how uh, each one of these is not only bolded, so it's clear what we're talking about, but what you have, have proposed here for each of these categories. Other commissioner thoughts? I appreciated that we didn't take a position, but you crafted a message that really was strategic and thoughtful. So thanks. Yep. Yeah, and good call on this. Uh, I think uh, one thing that Chris did that's really innovative around the public transportation call out for investment, you put Southwest Corridor or, or Southwest um, uh, Light Rail. So um, I think that was really a good foresight on yourself to advocate that some of that money could be dedicated here. So good call. I, I think the only uh, the the only thing that I noticed is usually our letters are signed by the chair and you put undersigned. So we're listing individuals since there's multiple. So I thought maybe we could just on behalf of the board of commissioners and have the chair sign. But other than that, I'm, I'm okay with that. Do commissioners have any other comments? I am just fine if it's signed by all commissioners too. I do appreciate your comment though. Uh, there is, oh, well, once it's put on letterhead, it's gonna fold over onto three pages, no doubt. So we're not saving any paper, but, and we are in terms of membership, for across our our three county region, we are the most uh, stable mm -hmm. commission of the three. So I think uh, for something of this scale, mm -hmm. and given how the legislature has so many changes, I think it would be impactful to actually have all five mm -hmm. individual signatures. If I, I agree with that. I would prefer to have all five signatures. Great. Thank you again for your good crafting on that. All righty. So now we'll move back to uh, board communication. Who would like to go first? I, I can go first and say um, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, we've had a good couple weeks of break and I hope everyone celebrated uh, and welcomed the 2023 uh, safely. Um, it's a busy month ahead and a busy week ahead this week, so um, more to report. Great. Anybody else? Anything? Welcome to January. It's like, whoo, whoo. Okay, well, I have, now it's on our oh, way. I, I kind of have a long list, so... But it's stuff that we do since we haven't had a meeting mm -hmm. since yeah. mid December. So um, you're you're finished, right? Take it away. Thank you. And you're you're okay. Go for it. <laughs> no, I, was just, I was just looking for approval to move. Leave forward. some oxygen in the air. Okay, I'll try. It. I'll try. So and I'll and I'm just going to hit the highlights just here. Leave some time for Commissioner Willie. Uh, okay. Um, Commissioner Fye and I had a uh, coffee with Mayor Beatty as part of our ongoing discussions, and we are going to continue that through this next year. I had a lunch with Representative Neron, Courtney Neron, and that was uh, part of my effort to stay engaged with legislators in the area. And uh, she had some interesting issues about tolling, and she also uh, wanted to talk to me about the Tonkin Trail and the kind of connection point for the Tonkin Trail. I told her I would put her in touch with uh, CWS. She was interested in talking to them too because there's some wetland issues and some other issues around that. So uh, I had the last meeting of impact and that included a briefing on the policy framework for the 2023 regional transportation uh, call for projects, regional transportation plan call for projects. And climate smart strategy update and climate analysis for RTP. 
We had a presentation on the factors of homelessness and regional cooperation. And I pull forward your comment about the work that's already been done on, on the climate issues. The I met with Representative Helm. He's, as you all know, very interested in water-related issues. And he's another person that I'm going to be connecting for a conversation with Clean Water Services. He's had other conversations with them, but was interested in having another. I met with Wendy Kroger for coffee, and Wendy, surprised me, brought uh, Dick Scouten with her, and they wanted to talk about Cooper Mountain. Uh, I believe that I followed the same uh, path that others have followed with them in relationship to the fact that our Metro Nature and Pro Parks measure funds are already allocated, uh, It's um, and it's unclear at this point if we have any other financial contribution that we would make. I'm in support of what they're trying to do, but I wanted to make it clear that um, I, I'm not in a position to make any commitments to about our funding here. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't attend the Safe Rest Pods tour. Um, that was a bad, bad sick day for me, but oh, feeling, bummer. Much, yeah, feeling much better. I had a it meeting. It was not a, a day where you would have wanted to stand in the cold if you weren't feeling well. Yeah, yeah. Well, you wouldn't have wanted to be around me either. So that's that's the good news. Uh, but thank you, and I'm glad that the rest of you did go on that. Um, I did have coffee with the Friends of Alpenrose. Now, the Friends of Alpenrose is a group. Alpenrose Dairy is in Multnomah County, as you know, but they're looking at the development there, and they wanted to meet with me because our current maps indicate that I that District 2 would be, at that time, in alignment with uh, Multnomah County, and they're concerned about the development going in there and the impact on uh, transportation. So uh, it's now Commissioner Fies, Commissioner Fies area, and so we'll we'll be talking <laughs> about what what that means. And I have a meeting scheduled with uh, land use and transportation as well, just to let you know what their concerns are and to um, make sure that I'm following up with with what their thoughts were. Uh, Councillor Huang from Metro is also convening a larger meeting with all the parties involved later in the year. I attended the community action board meeting and uh, there it wasn't a, a, a business meeting as much as it was a review of uh, Director Camp Shui's performance and to approve what his next steps and his, his goals and his, his race, but everything was uh, very positive along those lines. This week, I'm meeting with Just Compassion with Commissioner Willie. I have a Clean Water Services briefing. I have an impact strategy session uh, set up, and then I'm meeting with Washington County Kids briefing from uh, Katie Riley and Susan Bender Phelps. Katie reached out and asked if I would meet with her, and I have a meetup with uh, Senator Steiner. And before our meeting next Tuesday, you also have the oh, AOC, AOC. Yes, thank uh, you. Legislative Committee meeting and Board of Directors meeting. And then we have an acre meeting on Monday. Yes. It's hopping busy here in January. Yes. And I that those meetings for AOC are in Salem. And I assume you're going to be going yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes, indeed. And they've published the rotation uh, for what meetings will be face-to-face -face and what meetings will be uh, Zoom. So they use a different platform, I think. Yeah, Google, you're right. Ugh. Hybrid, I should have said hybrid. Or Google meets. Yeah, nothing like being face-to-face. -face. Anyway, who's next? Commissioner Willie, there's yeah. something. There's some still, still left in the room. <laughs> it will be fast then. Um, no, I, I attended uh, two retirements in the last couple of weeks. Don Odermont, of course, with the city. He had been there for uh, 28 years. And uh, the um, uh, I always call him the self-proclaimed transportation guru. But certainly um, the retirement party had um, a really good turnout. And they did some good roasting of Don, which he was certainly worthy of. But he had, his projects were, were listed in the slide presentation that he'd been involved with for all those years. And it's it's pretty impressive, the number of projects that um, he certainly had his fingers on. Um, and then the other one was uh, Commissioner Heimuller of Columbia County, 
Um, he has been the chair of uh, Northwest Act uh, for quite some time. And um, yeah, so we had to say goodbye to him. That was down at uh, Columbia County Fairgrounds, which uh, is not an easy place to find. It is, GPS doesn't even like it. So, uh, and considering that they've got, well, the highway there, whatever, Highway 30 that is, I think, um, is under construction so that you, where you're supposed to turn left, you can't turn left. Uh, anyway, it was interesting, but it was a good good uh, retirement party. And I was glad that uh, to be there and meet with some other folks around the other counties as well. Um, as Pam said, Safe Rest uh, Pods Tour, I did what did attend that with several of us. And it was, um, that was a, a great insight as to how uh, that collaboration with the city of Hillsboro is, and um, that's going to be a great facility when that uh, when that gets to be full build out. Um, <clears throat> had the legislative breakfast, chair, and I were at the legislative breakfast at the reserve where we got to talk to our legislators about <clears throat> providing adequate funding for our judicial system, uh, and I think they I, they hear this. This is the only time they actually. I think hear from the counties, and I think this is a great breakfast. I'm glad to see that we re were we were able to do that in person. Um, during a TV Highway Steering Committee with uh, Nafisa, certainly, um, and then I met with um, Debbie Garman, who is uh, what's the organization she's with? Uh, she's environmentalists. Um, and there was uh, four of them that met with me, and it was just a good conversation for me. Um, it's one of those educational things where you you get their perspective and maybe some suggestions on how we can move ahead on uh, some climate action uh, that isn't expensive or um, is not too arduous, I guess, on our staff. So anyway, it was a good conversation, and I said that I would continue to have conversations with them. And then um, one other thing is, um, I believe I'm going to have a new CPO out in Forest Grove that it's going to reactivate. Um, and so and the other ones um, so far have not been active or at least haven't been inviting me to attend. So maybe they, they're just doing it real quietly. But anyway, um, so my CPOs are certainly way behind yours, Pam, and yours has been very active for quite some time, but mine have not been. So I think I'll see some increased activity there. But yeah, we've got the fair board meeting this week. Um, meeting with uh, in with the Just Compassion folks with you, Pam, and then I've already had my CWS briefing, so that's pretty quick. So anyway, that's all I got. Thanks. Great, Commissioner Rogers. Let's see. I was going back and looking at it. Everything's been a blur, right? <laughs> For the last two weeks, I did uh, follow your advice. I did take a half a day at Christmas and a half a day at New Year's. <laughs> I worked every other day. So I'm getting better. That's better. But uh, not as good as I ought to be. I understand. WA board, uh, you would know that. And you'd know that. I went to their board meeting. It, it's always interesting, like every other nonprofit, and see what their committees are doing and that sort of thing and hear about their activities. So a lot of people I have known for a good number of years. Unfortunately, I had to miss uh, Dawn's uh, retirement party. I was in Tualatin uh, meeting with uh, some of their leadership. They're trying to keep me surprised what's going on there and asking me about the county business a little bit. So that's always nice to, to be with them. We had, uh, let's see, what else? Nothing. Nothing. And that's good. That's all I have. Very little. And how did the first couple of weeks of January feel for you? Uh, it'll be better. I think I might get a Sunday off every now and then. I'll be busy this month. Yeah. Well, don't forget, there's another national holiday coming up with Martin Luther King's birthday in a couple of Mondays. I still haven't gotten my head quite wrapped around the days of January yet, but it's... <laughs> My brain's working on it. So, yeah, it was uh, our last meeting was on the 13th, I think it was. So, yeah, they're looking mm -hmm. back. There were, I thought I only had one meeting I'd be highlighting, and it turns out there were at least six 
Commissioner Willie reminded me of, of the sixth, but just a few things I wanted to note at the um, Supportive Housing Services uh, Tri-County Planning Body meeting, uh, we continued our work in discussing priorities based upon needs. And uh, they sent us a survey and during the holidays and asked us to fill it out before the end of today. So I just tried to fill it out and it is was a far more extensive survey than I would have liked. So on the fourth group of prioritizing 10 items, I finally just had to select one through 10, one through 10 <laughs> as a way of signaling, don't have time to give this consideration and where they had things where you had to give reasons for your decisions. I just typed letters. So I think, and I commented, sorry, too long of a survey for one day response. So, oh, well, sorry, folks. Uh, I also attended an Urban League in-person meeting here about social justice needs. It was uh, informative, uh, continuing to talk about the need to improve the workforce, both for defenders as well as for um, uh, you know, legal aid, you name it. <laughs> There's a lot of work. And uh, Judge Proctor was just mentioning to me this morning uh, about the additional needs for the uh, non-unanimous jury decision to be revisited. So quite a workload happening there. Um, I'm curious, Ms. Angie, um, if you could speak to it uh, either later today or possibly on Thursday, how did things go for the safe rest pods during the inclement weather that we just had? And was it structurally sound and okay? I really appreciated staff, Washington County staff working with the city of Hillsborough and the, the, um, the partners uh, hosting that site for providing us with the tour capability. It was, it was good to see it in person. Uh, you know, being mindful that there are still more pods under construction. I had the December monthly chair mayor's meeting and the key agenda topic was to go over uh, legislative agendas uh, per their request, um, but the timing of that, they needed to uh, come back to it in January. So we went over the uh, touched on the, the county's ledge agenda, um, but we'll be picking back up on it in the January meeting. They also had questions about our budget situation. So I'd given them a large context setting of information uh, that I pulled all the information that we've had in our public meetings as part of our budget context. And as a result of that, um, they had very few comments. Um, so they're, uh, they're having a much better sense of how the county and the cities are partners in delivering services. And uh, also particularly for the city of Beaverton, they've been going through similar uh, budget challenges uh, as they have been needing to tap into their uh, catastrophic reserves. Um, so a lot of work ahead. I also had a meeting with uh, Senator Lieber and uh, Mayor Beatty talking about the upcoming legislature. And I think we touched on that in the meeting Commissioner Treese and I had with government relations as well. This Thursday, I sent a heads up as soon as I received the outreach from the governor elect's office uh, with a meeting, and I still don't know how widespread the meeting invite was, Ms. Angie, to discuss homelessness and behavioral health. Um, so we'll need to try and catch up before that meeting uh, late on Thursday. 
heads up to my colleagues to make sure that each of us completes our county council uh, performance review survey, feedback survey before January 10th. Thank you. Oh, good. I have more than just this Friday then. Um, and then the AOC meeting start up. It's January and acre. And um, Daniel, if Commissioner Treese and I could get your assistance, we had batted around the idea of having a an informal CPO seven meeting, uh, somewhat of a you know CPO seven meeting with commissioners, um, and hosting that as a uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, so if you could work with our community engagement team to help us support that. That's a CPO that's on hiatus now uh, as the volunteers have been tapped out. There's no leadership right now for yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. What's the phrase, inactive? That's, that's inactive phrase. status, yeah, yeah. So that's it for me. So onward to our leadership, Ms. Angie. Well, thank you and I'm fresh off of vacation, which was wonderful and really enjoyed the time with family and reconnecting. Uh, so I want to give you a brief public health um, update. Uh, late last month, Washington County briefly moved into medium community transmission for COVID per the CDC. The public health division let us know that we are at, we were at the very low end of that medium. Oh, see it two weeks off and I forgot I need a microphone. <laughs> Um, the public health uh, division let us know that we were at the very low end of medium with 10.6 hospital admissions per 100,000 residents and in, uh, in the last seven days, but that number has now improved to 7.7 .7 hospital admissions per 100,000 population. Uh, flu and respiratory uh, virus, uh, also commonly known as RSV transmission, have also been high so far this season, although positive test results and hospitalizations for both the flu and RSV have declined in the Portland Tri-County region for the last week of 2022. Um, public health is doing uh, messaging to inform the community in accordance to CDC guidelines. Um, I do appreciate uh, Chair Harrington also seeing um, um, flu RSV um, signage within our building. Um, I just want to highlight um, one of the um, maybe the silver linings of COVID is normalizing mask wearing uh, to uh, personal need and personal preference. And that's something that we really encourage here within the workforce, as well as just stay home if you're sick. Um, so I don't have any <laughs> quantitative information, but just qualitative information, we are hearing more of just employees just staying home. Um, part of that is also helpful because sometimes you may not be well enough to be in the office, but you can work and telework during that time. So the flexibility of that hybrid option is beneficial while still keeping ourselves and each other um, safe and hopefully healthy. Um, I do want to provide also a brief severe weather response um, update, and I will touch briefly on the safe, um, safe pods. Um, while many of us were out on holiday break, we had many employees that were working um, to ensure that we were in service to our community. Our region experienced severe weather starting just prior to the Christmas holiday. Our severe weather shelter system activated with two shelter locations operating for five nights, one in Hillsborough and one in Beaverton, that served a total of 51 people on average per night. In addition, outreach teams managed by the Supportive Housing Services Program made welfare checks to known encampments to get the word out to help transport people to these shelters or to provide other support as appropriate. Uh, regarding the um, pods, I haven't heard any concerns, but staff will just double check and report uh, back to the board on Thursday during your uh, monthly round table. So we're assuming all is well, but we'll still um, confirm. Uh, the biggest challenge um, problem we had was needing to close the baseline Beaver Creek encampment, and that was due to flooding, which your board is aware of. It's now closed, and the last report, at least six campers were provided um, shelter um, access. All were offered. 
to access. I also want to highlight a few of our other um, areas during uh, the severe weather. Our land use and transportation crews were out in force applying anti-icing solution ahead of the storm and working 12-hour shifts covering 24 hours per day from Wednesday, December 21st to Christmas Eve. Deputies in the Sheriff's Office assisted with several spinouts and other incidents throughout the event, and our electric utility partners worked to restore power to thousands of, our, of customers. I just want to um, express gratitude for all of these employees and partners who assist in the response to ensure that our community members are safe. And this just highlights how our community relies on our services day and night, and even through inclement weather and holidays. And that concludes my update. Well, thank you and welcome back from thank the you. holiday. Thank you. Yes. I have one question. Do we have free tests for employees for COVID? I mean, I, or is that all covered by their insurance? Yes. Federal oh. government has now issued a new round, a new round? of test kits. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so we can get them. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. oh. Mr. Carr. Thank you, Chair Harrington, and uh, Happy New Year to everyone. I hope everyone had a nice holiday uh, break. Uh, I certainly did. Uh, I don't have much to report. We did receive $660,000 on Friday as part of the uh, opioid settlement from the Johnson & Johnson. Uh, those funds will continue to trickle in. As you know, they've been all dedicated to the CAT uh, project, which is uh, ongoing. That's all I have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Taniguchi Dennis, hello. Hi, um, thank you, Chair Harrington, and a very happy new year to the Clean Water Services Board of Directors. And like Tanya shared, the weather just didn't take a holiday break for us this year, and the team kept our 24 7 operations running during the frigid temperatures, ice, snow, and heavy rain um, to continue serving our customers. I wanted to provide the board with three highlights about the team and their dedication to service. Um, the first one is kudos to John Allard's field operations crew. They took on a emergency lateral repair during that most, the lowest temperatures of the year and the damaged lateral could have put the customer out of service for the long holiday weekend. Um, we were not planning to send our crews out on that day unless they were in heated cabs like our sweepers. Um, whoever John's crew really braved that weather, the wind, and the elements to get the customer back in service. And John shared that it was the first time he had a customer cry on the phone, and it was tears of appreciation and joy when he called her to let her know how things were going. So kudos to that team. Um, the heavy rains had field operations and water resource recovery teams working around the clock. Um, Forest Grove seemed to get a very um, large um, sort of um, one of those cluster dumps of, of rain over the area, and it caused our Forest Grove high head pump station to be overwhelmed um, by the flows, causing the basement of that pump station to flood and the ability of the pumps to fail. So the team worked around the clock to get that rectified. The strong wind and rains brought down trees on two staff vehicles at the ABC parking lot, and that really required speedy response from Dennis Kramer and the landscape program staff to bring in the tree specialists so we could free the cars um, for the employees. No one was hurt, which we're very grateful for. Um, both Ryan Sandu and CJ Baxter were our local incident command, and they did a really excellent job leading our crews through the extreme weather and its challenges. And um, we're just very grateful that um, the weather is a little back to normal of our winter, of our normal winter weather. But um, that concludes my update for today. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Taniguchi Dennis and Ms. Angie for helping us uh, better understand and appreciate the work of the staff of the two agencies particularly under severe weather circumstances. I had the opportunity to stay informed by both county email, but also social media. And I was appreciative of the information that was uh, made as widely available as our staff could make it. So, and I'm, I really appreciate all of the hard work of all the employees and doing so, providing services while also being safe uh, because we wanna make sure our employees are as safe as possible as well. 
That's terrific. Can I say something? Diana, yeah. just again, as you know, I didn't mention my update. I, I attended your Christmas function at the Durham plant and people there uh, certainly uh, seem to be a very united group of workers and it was uh, nice to see happy faces. So uh, <clears throat> thanks again for all that you do. And, and I know Mark was there and others. So thanks. I'd also like to give a shout out to those uh, employees that stayed here in the building and stayed working while many of us were not working. So I, I really do appreciate Aaron and David and others for and Kevin that were available to to respond to questions and issues. So it was it was great. Yeah. And well done. Thank you. Alrighty. Well, we don't have to check in on our board agenda for later because we already did that. So without further ado, we'll proceed then with our uh, topic number five, uh, Public Health Advisory Council member appointments. Hello, Ms. Samantle. <laughs> oh, and yes, there is uh, Marie Bowman Davis as well. And is Alex Coleman with us? Oh. No? No? Yeah. <laughs> running a little is bit. Is Alex early. online? Huh? Yeah, you should oh, she is. Okay, commentary. wonderful. Yeah, we're just a minute ahead of schedule. Yes, if you could promote her, that would be great. Kevin. Surprise, surprise. Sometimes we are a little bit faster. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, well, good um, Good afternoon, Chair Harrington, Board of County Commissioners. For the record, my name is Mira Samantle. I'm the um, Interim Director of Health and Human Services, um, and we are here before you today to recommend some appointments to our Public Health Advisory Council. So I will go ahead and introduce Marie Bowman Davis, who is our Public Health Division Manager, and with us online is Alex Coleman, a Senior Program Coordinator with Public Health, and I will go ahead and turn it over to the two of them for today's presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, for the record, Marie Bowman Davis, uh, she, her, hers, public health division manager and uh, your board's uh, local appointed public health administrator. Um, we are excited to bring to you today some new appointees uh, for your consideration for the Public Health Advisory Council, and I'd like to turn it over to Alex. Hey, good afternoon, Alex Coleman, uh, she, her, hers. I am the staff facilitator for the Public Health Advisory Council. Um, so today we are putting forward uh, two recommendations to fill positions for long-term members who are at their term limits. And so that would be Michelle Williams and Lucia Benavides. Um, we are also putting forward a new um, appointment for Ainsley Fancher to fill a current vacancy and then seeking the reappointment of David Applesheimer for a second term. Does the board have any questions or concerns about any of those candidates? I don't see any questions from board members here. Uh, I do want to highlight though, that in the packet on uh, page 14 of 155 today, I think the information under Michelle Williams may need to be updated um, because there's Michelle Williams and then it says Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. I know. That's all. So before we go to act on it, that would be great. Thank you, Chair Harrington. I appreciate you noting that and we will um, make that change and make sure it's accurate prior to coming back for an action item. But based upon all the information I saw in the packet, I'm certainly uh, comfortable with the uh, recommendations and the work that has gone into interviewing folks as well. So thank you once again for bringing us a really great slate. So along that along that um, question, mm -hmm. it's there's Grace Grace. Is that what you're thinking? No. There's Williams. so under, but on the new applicants page, it says so Michelle Grace Williams, Garcia. Grace, excuse me, Grace Garcia. And then the, um, the application has got the name Grace Garcia. So that is Michelle, yeah, correct? I'm looking to Alex table. online. Is that correct, Alex? So in addition to page 14 of 55, she's referring to 
the table that's on page 12 okay. for the entry of Michelle Williams, Perrin, Grace Garcia, Got and it. then the application. Yeah, so it looks like there was a there's typos in the applicant profile. So we will get those fixed before Thank you. the next meeting. Thank you. We will be back on January 17th for an action item and incorporate those uh, those changes that are necessary. Thank you. Great. Thank I, you. I wanted to add, um, I'm on that board, on that committee, the advisory committee, and uh, Alex, you do a wonderful job facilitating those meetings. I just wanted to give you a shout out and appreciate all the work that you did last year. And Maria is under your leadership. Thank you, Commissioner Fai. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we'll move on to the Planning Commission appointments. And for this, I'm welcoming the LUT folks, Stephen Roberts and Todd Borkowitz. Morning. Morning. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm That's sorry. Right. Right. My eyes are watering. Oh, okay. no, so good afternoon, commissioners. Um, Stephen Roberts, Director of Land Use and Transportation. Todd Borkowitz is with me. He's an associate planner in our long range planning work group. And uh, we're here to talk today about a couple of planning commission appointments. Um, one uh, representing or, or with deference given to the commissioner, um, District 2 rep and uh, District 4 rep. So with that, I'll turn it over to Todd. Thank you, Stephen. Just wait for the presentation. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Harrington and Commissioners. I'm Todd Borkowitz, Associate Planner with the LUT Community Planning Group. Um, and uh, here today to discuss planning commission appointments for districts two and four. Next slide, please. Uh, the purpose is to highlight eligible candidates for your consideration for vacancy in districts two and four. The appointees will replace long term long-serving PC members, Jeff Petrillo and Matt Wellner. Uh, their terms will expire at the end of this month due to term limits. Uh, there are six eligible candidates shown here. Uh, three reside in District 2 and three reside in District 4. Application details are included in your packet. And upon the uh, term expiration of Matt Wellner, there will be one current PC member uh, engage principally in the buying, selling, and development of real estate. Applicants Mike Frey and Jared Whip, both from District 2, principally perform work in this industry, so only one, but not both, could be appointed to the PC at this time. Here's a map showing where applicants and current PC members reside. The map reflects recent boundary changes to the Board of Commissioner Districts. We can come back to that. Based on their experience, staff recommends appointment of Mike Frey for District 2 and Joe Kaiser for District 4. Each would be eligible for a four-year term starting February 1st, and each would later be eligible for an additional four-year term. The current diversity on the PC would be maintained with these appointments at 33.3% BIPOC and 44.4% women. We hope to learn whether the board is prepared to proceed with these two appointments at the scheduled January 17th board meeting. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions or comments? No, Pam and I, Pam and I met uh, with the, um, well, S Stephen and Todd. And um, we agree with uh, the analogy. I mean, the Planning Commission uh, is an extremely difficult position just because of the complexity of issues. And so we just wanna make sure we have good people on there. And um, certainly we will miss um, the two outgoing um, commissioners that spent a lot of time on their 10 years. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Um, and certainly want to tell them thank you for their service. I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Welly, and um, we went through a lot of the different candidates and uh, looked at different uh, mixes. And there are some that have like, three other assignments within the county, and those types of things that made it that that helped move the decision along. Aside from uh, skills and uh, experience, 
<clears throat> okay, well, seeing no other comments, uh, I'll chime in. Uh, I do really appreciate the service both of uh, Matt Wellner and Jeff Petrillo. They were very knowledgeable, very active, worked hard to gather and listen to different perspectives and do the important work that uh, the Washington County Planning Commission does. Um, I had the opportunity to talk with Mr. Wellner about that the situation of their departures and missing being able to count on their tenure and their, their commitment to service and was comforted to learn of uh, Mr. Wellner's efforts to help recruit others. Um, and I feel very comfortable uh, in having you move forward with these uh, two recommended appointments, uh, as you have heard from both Commissioners Willie and uh, Commissioners Trees today. So, I'd, I'd also like to underscore your comments about uh, Matt Wellner and uh, Jeff Petrillo. They they both been great. Uh, to to your point, over the holiday week, one of my constituents had a retaining wall. Uh, fall during a, a flooding situation, oh. and uh, he sent an email, to, copied me, to um, Todd and to uh, um, Matt Wellner, asking about it, whose property was where. And Matt got back to him before any of us could. <laughs> so it was it was great to see that. So so anyway, I I appreciate their service, but they also really did together the recruitment work that uh, will, will help us as we move forward with the plan. Yeah. I have one quick little question. We used to send out little certificates of thank you. So we still do that. We do. Uh, yes. And, and I was just going to say, Teresa, thank you. So let me a little note to remind me, thankfully, um, that we are planning to have a, a little send off event for those two members on January 18th as a part of their work session yeah. at the planning commission meeting. So we would encourage you if you're available right. to drop in and those are virtual or in person. Okay. Now what was the date again? I'm sorry. Uh, January 18th, uh, 17th. Oh, 17th. Yeah. Okay. Wednesday. No, I'm sorry. It is January 18th. 18th uh, is your, Wednesday. Your meeting is uh, the yeah. time of the uh, It is uh, 6 o'clock for the celebration and then 6.30 for the PC meeting. Yeah. So we'll, we'll send you yeah, an invitation. Send me an invite yeah, that way if you're able to attend. Yeah. yeah, I think that would be great. And yes, we do want to <clears> definitely <throat> acknowledge their 10 years of service, 10 plus years of service, and really appreciate the the uh, expertise that, uh, that they've uh, brought and, and really just thoughtful input and um, not not afraid to push back on staff too. We, that's, a, that's a good thing. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you as well you. to the staff efforts for handling the recruitment and application process uh, and all of the efforts that go into broadcasting these opportunities and really our reliance upon our community members stepping forward mm -hmm. uh, to volunteer their time and their expertise yep. to serve the greater community. Really appreciate it. All righty. Well, you're off the hook now, but Mr. Roberts isn't <laughs> uh, because he and Greg Munn and Mira Samantel will be joining us for the next pretty meaty topic. Um, and I will assume that we can press on moving forward uh, with the program cost recovery proposals for land use and transportation and, and health and human services. Uh, and thank you for all of the information that's in the packet. Definitely. Yep. All right, well, I drew the short straw today, so I'll start. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Harrington and commissioners. My name is Greg Mon. I'm the treasurer and financial officer for the county. And I am joined here by Stephen Roberts with the LUT and Mira Samantel from HHS. Uh, we are 
here to discuss options and recommendations for a fee-based cost recovery plan for the county's planning, building, services, and environmental health programs. These programs provide services to specific subsets of the community and are traditionally funded on a fee-based revenue model with the objective of breaking even and providing stable, high quality and customer responsive services over time. So uh, while our time here is short today and both LUT and HHS have a lot of material to cover, I will keep my comments brief and focused on providing the board with a few framework guideposts on the topic of government charges and fees for you to consider during the ensuing presentation from Mr. Roberts and Ms. Mantle. And as you know, the last few months, we've had several conversations regarding the redesign of our budget processes and the balancing of our general fund. So today's work session is uh, a topic, or it's today's work session topic is one of many key components to consider in achieving both, both of those objectives. So today's objectives, we have a few up here on the board. One is to review cost recovery, best practices and policies. I'll be covering that. Then I will turn it over to uh, Stephen, who I think is going to go first, and then uh, Mira after that, mm -hmm. talk about cost recovery options for LUT and HHS. And then we'll have a, we can have a couple uh, conversations about advanced fee increases and related recommendations to achieve or move toward program cost recovery for specific regulatory services if directed by the board, and then how this relates to the FY23-24 budget. Okay, so up here is a list of uh, six bullet points that are considered best practices for fees, rates, charges established by, um, by government entities, which would apply to us. So these six recommendations are consistent with the county's budget process redesign work and can provide the board with guideposts in considering these and future rate adjustments. So the first is to consider uh, when developing rates and charges is to consider the applicable laws and statutes before the implementation of the specific charges and fees. That's bullet point number one. Uh, number two is to adopt formal policies regarding charges and fees that identify factors to be considered when setting price, including affordability, pricing history, inflation, alternative service delivery options, and available efficiencies. Number three is calculate the full cost of providing a service in order to provide a basis for setting the charge or fee, including both direct and indirect costs and capital depreciation. Number four, review and update charges and fees periodically based on factors such as the impact of inflation, costing, uh, other cost increases, adequacy of cost recovery, use of services, and the competitive competitiveness of current rates. By updating fees on a periodic basis, this may help smooth charges and fees over several years with those charged by comparable or neighboring jurisdictions can guide a governing body when setting rates. It can also differentiate service levels to reveal services or pricing variances and options. Number five, utilize long-term forecasting to ensure that the charges and fees anticipating anticipate future costs in providing the service. This is a factor you will see in particular with LUT's analysis coming up in a few slides. And provide number six, provide information on charges and fees to the public, including the opportunity for community feedback, particularly when new rates are introduced or when existing rates are changed. Slide number four is uh, uh, additionally, we do have some uh, guidance in our in our strategic plan, uh, the county 2000 and 2020 specifically state that LUT's current planning and land use, uh, land development and building programs should maintain self-sufficiency through fees. Uh, policy questions, uh, does the board support proposed fee increases and related recommendations to achieve or move toward a program cost recovery in these programs? And then just a little uh, slide here that we've, we've uh, sort of practiced this one Washington County method and coming together, the three of us, I'm here just to provide an overview of best practices, but the lion's share of the work, and literally I mean that, is, are these two here in front of me. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to 
Stephen, unless you have any questions for me. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to ask Aaron Wardell to come up. Aaron's actually going to run through the LUT proposal, and then Sheila. She's over there. Okay, Sheila. Hey. <laughs> uh, and then I just wanted to point out Sheila Jambrone is our uh, senior administrative services manager. She's the person who actually helps make sure that the department runs. Uh, and she's been very instrumental in this work too. So I wanted to make sure that we, you know, that she's here in case there are questions that she can help to answer as well as we go through this. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. My name is Erin Wardell. I'm the Planning and Development Services Division Manager in LUT. So our first slides here are a bit of a review from our work session in December, where we shared with you the results of our consultant fee assessment that we've been conducting over the last several years. So this slide contains a summary of the work that we do, which is providing some of our necessary life safety um, functions. We protect people, we reduce costs and damages in case of disasters, and we support communities and businesses. Who pays for this work? Um, our customers pay fees in order to support the work that we do. And we have a challenge now that our fees are not covering the actual cost of administering our programs. So that's the challenge that we face today. Over time, our fee increases have not kept up with the cost of providing these services. We also have seen changes in the types of development that we have coming in the door. And so we're not seeing as many of the large projects that pay very large fees, and that's impacted our overall uh, fund balance. So the impact of this challenge has been reduced staffing. Our existing staff are feeling pretty overloaded, and we've had to reduce our service levels and depleted our reserves. So we've taken a number of actions to date to try to resolve these challenges. We did um, do incremental fee increases in fiscal years 2021 and 22-23. We have reduced our staff uh, primarily through attrition and being very careful about which vacancies we fill when we have vacancies on our teams. We have taken on other cost saving measures as much as possible in our budgets. And then we conducted this independent assessment, which you heard about back at the December work session to really take a look at our workflows and develop recommendations for sustainable service levels and funding. We've also conducted ongoing stakeholder engagement with our community members. We've been working with your board and with our development constituents as well over the last several years. So coming out of the work that our consultant conducted for us, we received the assessment recommendations that are summarized on this slide. The consultant identified opportunities for process improvements and how we do our work, and we've implemented a number of those already and are looking forward to implementing more of those. Those are things like um, looking at various ways to uh, manage the work that we have to do with reduced staffing. We have implemented changes to how we do building permit intake, for example, in order to be able to do them more efficiently. We are allowing for concurrent review, which is an opportunity for our builders to move their projects through our system a little bit faster. Um, and we're also considering future technology upgrades. So things like allowing our customers to directly submit their permits through our system um, and other opportunities to use technology to really be able to make the most of our system. So we continue to look at that. On the staffing side, we've been looking very strategically at filling our budgeted vacancies in order to be able to keep up with the workload, but not overstaffing. And we've been looking at opportunities for sustainable funding. So the recommendation here coming out of this work was to implement a catch-up fee increase because we've fallen significantly behind in keeping up with our costs <clears throat> to do a future annual fee increase based on the program cost index so that we don't end up in this situation again and we're able to keep up with costs as they're increasing and that'll help us avoid the need for a big increase in the future that type of consistent annual increase is in keeping with best practices it also allows us to um, avoid surprises for our customers they know that there will be an annual adjustment and they know to expect that Another recommendation is to implement a technology fee in order to keep up with the costs of the critical systems that we need and that our customers rely on. The recommendation also included slowly restoring our depleted funds so that we continue to maintain reserves in case we need them in the future as these are our cycles that we need to be able to weather. 
The consultant also recommended that we consider external funding for activities and current planning that are not generating revenue. So this is a summary of what those recommendations were and some of the work we've already done on them. As a part of the consultant recommendations, we shared with you some scenarios for increases and scenarios for staffing levels. Coming out of that work, um, their work was based on fiscal year 2021 trends, and so we updated it to reflect what we're currently seeing as far as development activity and what we expect mm -hmm. to see over the next couple of years. And so that revised some of the key assumptions. We use the same methodology. We just wanted to make sure we were using the most updated numbers to run these scenarios. So while things are still somewhat fluid, um, we're seeing that development activity is trending down. And so we expect that to continue at least in the next year, possibly. Um, that has some effect on the assumptions about the number of staff that we need basically to keep up with the workload. And so that does affect the numbers that we generated. We'll need to fill fewer of our vacant positions if development activity is slower. So that's one of the ways that changes those numbers. But we do expect that personnel and indirect costs will continue to increase going into the future. So we're still seeing a need for um, increases in the fees. So with lower revenue estimates, we need to increase our revenues to offset the increased cost of maintaining our staffing levels, plus the cost of filling a few essential vacancies that exist on our teams today. So we still do see the need to add some staff to, still, to fill some of those vacancies. Um, additionally, with ongoing general fund constraints, we anticipate that the development-related functions and current planning still need to remain self-sufficient going into the future, and that we wouldn't expect to see a substantial increase. We do receive an annual $325,000 general fund and video lottery contribution, and that pays for our code compliance functions within current planning. So we did not, in our scenarios, expect that we would see more which means that current planning's fees need to keep up with additional costs for things that are not related to development. So for developing our cost recovery proposals, our objective is to continue to provide good service to the community and consistently meet our targeted service levels to catch up with our past program cost increases that outpaced our prior fee increases to assure full cost recovery for both of these programs for their development related activity and to adjust our fees annually based on our program cost changes. This gives us the ability over time to stabilize, restore and maintain our depleted fund balances. So our cost recovery proposals came to the conclusion that we need to increase our fees by about 50% over the next two years in order to catch up with our past cost increases and put us in a stable position going forward into the future. We're proposing to implement an annual fee index so that we'll be able to keep up with projected program cost increases in the future and to provide that certainty to our community and avoid these large unexpected fee increases. We propose to implement a technology surcharge and we're estimating that would be five to 7% on permit and application fees in addition to allow us to support critical hardware and software upgrades and to stabilize and gradually restore um, our reserve funds over time. So this slide summarizes three different options for how we can achieve that 50% cost increase over the next two years. We looked at um, these three different scenarios in depth and we ran a variety of different numbers. Again, this is assuming that development activity will be slowing over that time period. So we baked that into the assumptions. In the top box, looking at a 50% increase in 23-24, um, we would be able to budget for both programs. They'll break even in 23-24 we would be able to add a half FTE within current planning and one and a half FTEs in building services. This is really similar to the 4010 option, which is the next one, and that is our staff recommendation. So we would do a 40% increase 23-24 and then a 10% potential increase um, in 24-25 in order to get us to that 50% amount. This would allow both programs to break even in 24-25 the fund balances for both programs are projected to remain adequate to develop balanced budgets for those fiscal years. And this would again allow us to add that half FTE in current planning and one and a half in building services. 
Now, the third option we looked at is doing a 35% increase, 23-24, and then the 15% increase the year after that. This scenario is more challenging for us. It, it would make it challenging, particularly for current planning to be able to break even in this next budget year. So it's a scenario that we'd have to be really careful with and play with a little bit more before we could get to there. That's why it's not our staff recommendation. And it would not allow us to add any additional staff positions in either program, but that we've identified the need for those additional staff. Um, the scenarios also differ in how quickly we'll be able to restore our depleted reserve funds. And you'll see that in some of the next graphs as well. Um, in any case, we're being pretty conservative in these numbers and it will take us a while to restore our depleted fund balances. Um, so in all three scenarios, we did assume that after the initial one or two year catch up in large increases, we'll be doing an annual increase of some sort and we'll have to figure out what we will base that program cost index on. We did assume that current planning would continue to receive the 325,000 each year for code enforcement activities that it has typically received. And we assumed that technology surcharge would be included in there as well. So these next, these next two slides look at what these uh, financial projections look like going out through the 27-28 fiscal year. And so what you're seeing on this slide is our current planning um, fund balance. So the bar chart lines here are our reserve account. And so you can see how we've drawn down that reserve account over time. And with this, this is looking at that 40%, 10% increase scenario. You can see that gradually over time, we start to build back up our reserves. It's not dramatic. It's going to take us a long time to build that reserve account back up. But this does give us the breathing room to be able to do that. And you can see that we're projected to break even in 24-25 in this fund. And then this is the same uh, type of chart, but this is for our building services team. And so again, you're seeing that that fund balance is able to build itself back up over time gradually. And we're projected to break even in 24-25. We did run these numbers in comparison to comparable jurisdictions. You saw some of similar slides to these in our presentation on December 6th. So looking at how we compare to some of our partner jurisdictions, the light green line here is our current residential building permit fee for an example, 2,600 square foot single family home in this case. So you can see the light green line, we were running relatively middle of the pack and that these proposed fee increases would put us generally at the top um, for this particular type of building activity. But we are attempting a really high level of cost recovery there. This next slide shows us the commercial building permit fees. We're not actually the highest in this one. City of Gresham outpaces us a little bit in terms of the cost, but we're also not out of line with some of the other jurisdictions who are summarized here. And then in current planning, uh, there's a little bit of an important note on this one, which is that the jurisdictions that have a star next to their name are jurisdictions that attempt a high level of cost recovery for current planning rather than a large subsidy from some other funding source. It's fairly common for jurisdictions to heavily subsidize their current planning activity, um, which we don't and some other jurisdictions don't do either, at least not at that high of a level. But I think the others are more at 75% of current planning activity and we've tried to be closer to 100%. So for a typical current planning fee uh, set for a 10 lot subdivision with one street, this is where we fall compared to other jurisdictions. We are not as high as city of Beaverton where we would be comparable to Multnomah County and to city of Gresham under this scenario. So indexing and fund balance policies. So developing an annual fee index policy, we would be looking at um, developing a program cost index, which would be subject to continued refinement in consultation with our finance department. Um, this would be based on the actual program costs, including all direct and indirect costs. 
we would be looking at potential minimum and maximum increases each year. So somewhat of a range, perhaps there you know, couldn't be a negative <laughs> increase in cost, but also we wouldn't want to go over some percentage amount either. That's fairly typical with funds that do some kind of an index increase. Um, so this is something we'd be looking at developing more policies around. We are working with finance to formalize our reserve and fund balance target policies as well. Reserve funds are really essential for enterprise fund programs similar to these because we have boom and bust cycles and sometimes you need to use your reserves and sometimes you build up your reserves. And so we want to make sure that we are resilient. Um, both of our reserve funds have been spent down considerably over the last few years. So next steps for LUT. We are continuing to refine and prepare our current planning and building services fee schedules as part of the 23-24 budget process. We're reviewing current and future anticipated costs for hardware, software, and staff needed to support our and enhance our critical technology systems. And that's our estimate for incorporating a technology surcharge. We're working to develop and finalize policies for annual fee indexing and reserve fund balance targets we're also doing ongoing stakeholder outreach around this work that we've been doing. So we've been working with the Home Building Association and with our LUT Development Forum participants. We have scheduled a meeting on January 19th, the listening session around this work, and we'll be inviting those partners to join us for that and come and ask us questions about this work. Um, we're also meeting individually with the small cities who we provide building services to. So we already had our meeting with the city of Banks. I think we're meeting with city of Gaston tomorrow and looking at getting something scheduled to North Plains in the next few days as well. So um, reaching out and having an opportunity to talk to them. We continue to work on our internal process improvements. One of the things we wanted to highlight for you is that we're working with Portland State University to do a training on cultivating an improvement mindset and building up our internal staff capabilities around process improvement. And so we have a number of staff enrolled in um, that process improvement course, which is starting next week. We do need to act now in order to keep these programs financially solvent. We're not in a good position right now, and we've put off the large increases that we've needed for a number of years. So the time is now. We're trying to balance this need for urgency with the needs of our customers and their expectations for knowing how much their permits and their development fees are going to cost them. We don't expect that we will be able to balance the budget for current planning in 23-24 without at least a 40% fee increase. So that's why this is a critical situation. We're also not alone in dealing with these challenges. A number of other jurisdictions are facing exactly what we're facing today. City of Beaverton recently increased their planning fees by 250%. City of Gresham is working towards a 50% increase over time as well. So that's just two examples, but other jurisdictions are doing this along with us. And we know that flexibility remains important. We're keeping an eye on trends. We're keeping an eye on how much staffing we actually need and trying to do the best we can with all of the internal levers that we can, we can pull. Um, but we really can't move forward without doing something pretty significant in terms of the fee increase at this time. Could I... Thank you. Could I take a pause here for just a moment? Because I'm uh, thinking because of nonverbal uh, body language that I'm concerned that if we hold all questions until the end uh, versus take LUT questions and HHS questions that we might be tipping the scales a little bit for ourselves. So that's why I wanted to ask you, Ms. Angie, for some advice. Chair, I think that's very appropriate because this is really the second conversation the board is having on LUT. Today will be the first conversation on HHS. Yeah. So that will be really all new material compared to you. We've been talking about um, these fees, I know, since I started the county. So this has been an ongoing discussion. Yes, indeed. So what I would like to do is um, call the board's attention to um, next steps and um, policy questions. So uh, today you've given us uh, some staff recommendations for LUT and uh, no matter where we end up with picking 
for each category of current planning and um, building services. For adopting those new fees, would that would we need to weigh in formally at a business meeting, or will that be done as part of the? But I finally found it on page one thirty seven of one fifty five. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next steps would be to refine the fee schedules and developing the budgets. Uh, and but will all of that uh, will all this come back to us as part of the budget, or will there be a separate action for adopting the fee structures before we adopt the the next fiscal year budget? Um, so I will speak to typically, and then I will speak to the situation in and of itself. So typically the board does adopt a, a full fee schedule as part of your formal budget adoption process. As this is, uh, we would be um, reaffirming the fee philosophy in this case, that um, it is a cost recovery fee. And due to the level of fee, I would suggest that we have board action prior to the budget, just as a thumbs up, kind of give, give staff direction to move forward. The reason why is because um, as um, the team has already indicated, we are working with multiple stakeholders that really want to understand what, what are going to be, what, what's projected to be the fees moving forward so that they can do their due diligence and plan. So out of the spirit of partnership and being a good partner to our stakeholders, that's why I would suggest a board action sooner than waiting for the full budget process in this case. Okay. Well, with that as a common baseline, commissioners, what questions do you have and what comments do you have with regard to these two LUT proposals? Who would like to start? start. Great. A couple of uh, comments. Uh, one, uh, I think as a business person, I always detest increases in fees. But as I said, I think we ought to increase our fees to match what our costs are. So I'm not as alarmed as you might think I would be. So I, I certainly understand that process. Uh, maybe an enhancement would be is to uh, also indicate the amount of cost containment we're doing because the proposal you, you have little bits and pieces but one of the charges against government is you know every time you have a little bit of a downturn you want to raise fees and you're not tightening your belt and i think you are in this process so i i think if you could you know talk about that a bit more as you make the proposal later on that, you know, here's what we're doing, it's just not all raising fees. The second point I would make is one of the complaints I've heard from cities over many years is that they don't want to be in a bidding war for projects with the county. And these uh, fee increases actually make us, uh, as far as the fee, very comparative to what the cities are doing. And so I find that particularly appealing because I think that makes some sense. So uh, my my position, I, I'm not opposed to the fee increases at all. I think that if you could enhance your conversation a little bit to say, but we are doing lots of cost containment and here's what we're doing. And uh, and you heard my comment on the other. So that was that. Given the body language over to my right, two commissioners, could you go next? <laughs> <laughs> Why, did you see me writing notes here? No, no, I heard every I'm size so, well, from each of you probably during the course of the this, too. So. Well, this is, um, to me, and I've had this conversation with Stephen, and I appreciate him doing it on the holiday. Um, so let me just start with some base stuff. So these, the 40% fees that you're proposing is assuming a baseline of services that we will continue to provide. So is that this year's service level, last year's service level? Because you and I have had the conversation of, um, if we're really talking about a recession, you know, those things are gonna go down. So are we, are you gonna be, if those things, if that would happen, 
in the 23, 24, you're going to come back next year and say, oops, you know, it's not another 10%, it's going to be another 25%. So I just want to know what our baseline of service projected service delivery that that we're increasing 40%. Yeah. Um, that, that's a, an excellent question. And I think uh, we've, we've had we've had service level targets, some some of which are established in the building code, some of which are statutory for current planning. And so we we have certain mandatory timelines that we have to meet. So we'll obviously continue striving to meet those. In addition, we have a number of internal um, service level targets, which are again, all mostly time-based. So we, we anticipate trying to provide a, a continued high level of service that meets the same um, same or in some cases, hopefully better uh, service levels that we've been providing over a long period of time. Um, and as you say, this is sort of, uh, it's a multivariate equation and nothing's ever static, unfortunately. That's one of our challenges with trying to project forward. So uh, as you, as Aaron noted, we've, we've made some assumptions about uh, declining development activity but maintaining or even slightly enhancing our staffing levels. And so between the, the reduced development activity and some very targeted additions to staffing, we think that we will have the resources available to be able to meet those target service levels consistently going forward. As I said, there are a lot of assumptions here and those assumptions are all subject to change as we get further in and learn more over the next year. So I would say, you know, one of Aaron's points was that flexibility will be important as we go forward. We're projecting the best information that we have now and um, our, our um, certainly our strong intention to meet uh, those service level targets. And we just need to, you know, be aware that there are a lot of things that can change between now and next year. So to your to the second part of your question about might we come back and ask for something bigger next year, I, I would say that could be a possibility, but we hope that we've been relatively conservative in these projections and, and don't need to go higher than 10% next year. So. Okay. Um, I think it needs to be more clearly emphasized rather than an asterisk that this 40% does not include your technology fee. Mm -hmm. So we're really talking of 45 to 47% fee. So the five to 7% technology fee you're anticipating is going to generate how much money? And how did you come up with was it, Did that come from the consulting uh, organization as well as you need to have X amount of dollars of technology? Because I'm not opposed to a technology fee. Mm -hmm. it, it feels a little heavy right now. If you'd ask us maybe for that last year, mm -hmm. and it was a five to seven percent increase, I could have got that. But forty plus five is mm -hmm. a little heavy. So I'm I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of you. Yeah, no, no, th those are excellent questions, and I think that's one of the the things that we're certainly conscientious of, and so we're we're trying to make some distinctions about the fees for the the basic service that we provide. So that gets to the forty and ten percent proposal. And then the technology, again, in addition, that's a fairly substantial cost to us to continue to um, not just uh, look for upgrades to those systems, but really even just the maintenance of the system that we have um, that does require full-time dedicated support. So we do have some real costs associated with that. And so um, other jurisdictions have also implemented technology fees. It's a it's a one way of just sort of being transparent about the need to provide and adequately fund that service in addition mm -hmm. to just the specifically the development related services you provide. So we're in the process right now of really taking a hard look at what our current ongoing operating costs are relative to our, our technology support. And then we are also in the process of looking at some technology, specific technology upgrades that we hope, as uh, Aaron was alluding to, would help us to facilitate a, a more seamless customer interface and allow customers to actually submit their permit applications and help help to minimize the amount of staff time that uh, we need to engage with folks. And then we're, we're hopeful that that just provides a, a much more seamless customer interface too. So we're trying to sort of look at, again, just those ongoing operational costs and then some potential targeted future technology upgrades. And that was how we'll get back to a, a specific percentage. So what's 5% what's generate? Do you know off the top of your head? I mean, if you don't know right now, then- Yeah, we'll follow up. Email yeah, I don't know email. exactly okay. what the number would be off the top of yeah, your head. Okay. 
Um, then just real quickly, slide 19, uh, jurisdiction fee comparison. The, we, that is a huge variance in there. Yes. Um, what, what causes that? So I guess my question is, to those uh, like Clackamas and Hillsboro being on the low end of this thing, does that just mean they subsidize these? They heavily subsidize from other funding sources. Uh, okay. They also have a much smaller UUA to deal yeah. with too. That's that's true, and I thank you for that, uh, Catherine, because uh, I have to keep my head around the fact that this is just our unincorporated areas, and that was my question about had you had these conversations with our small cities out there, Gaston Banks and North Plains, because we provide these services for them and certainly uh, will impact their uh, service level as well. So right. go ahead, I'm sorry, Erin. We provide the building services to those small cities. And right. so in our conversation with City of Banks, um, they were supportive of the work that we'd been doing and certainly understood how we got here. And they thanked us for the work that the county does for them. And they really gave their appreciation for the good work that our, our building inspectors and our plans reviewers and our permit techs do for them. Okay. Right. And and stress their their uh, need for us to continue to provide that service. Well, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think that's really an option that they can take their ball and go someplace else. It's uh... We're the only game in town for them, really. So I get that, but I want to be really sensitive to having that communication, making sure they're tracking with us. Absolutely. Well, they might be able to have uh, other nearby cities provide that service, but it's going to cost more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we're, I think it's fair to say we're probably the least cost alternative. That it could be quite possible, right? Yeah, and I think that as we as we talk about yes, uh, you know, cities providing services outside their jurisdictional boundaries, you know, they're going to need to recover full costs to do that work. And so I think that's your point, Chair, is that those costs may actually even be higher than yeah. than what we're finding ours to be. And I, and I think as a relatively large program, we we hopefully I think achieve some cost effectiveness just just by the size of the program itself. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Trees, thoughts. Thank you. A um, couple things. I, as as we look at this, I, I, under, I understand the, the situation, and I appreciate uh, Stephen you talking to me about this offline and increasing my level of understanding. Um, I think that it's important as we do this with our customers that we do have, and I believe this is what you were getting at, kind of a guaranteed service level as well so that you know we're going to do this but you can expect this and i think that that's really important the other comment i want to make is that um looking at the chart on page 14 the um your recommendation is the 40 percent increase in year one and the 10 percent increase in year two and i'm hoping that through your discussions with other users that um, you have the option to ask them if, if they might prefer the 50% now and just get it over with. And mm -hmm. in, instead of going 40% and then 10% and then another percent, because you, this is 10 plus whatever the increase might be, right? I mean, so, so I'm just thinking that they may have a different viewpoint on that. So I would encourage that. The other thing that I'm just going to state this for for the public here. When I was talking to Stephen yesterday, we were um, we were talking about the uh, the term catch up, and the, I just don't want it to be at all misleading that we are not. This increase doesn't have anything to do with filling a void that might have been previous in our in our in our revenue structure. So this is catching up. In other words, with the the, the amount the fee is not any deficit that may have been there in the past. So, so I, it's I, a systems catch up, I thought. In yes, it absolutely is. But I'm just saying when you use the term catch up, when I looked at it, I'm thinking about it from a public standpoint, I was worried that people might think we were using new fees based on a 40% or 50% increase to pay for lost revenue previously. That's what I was worried about. It's just, it, it's... It's not a backfill. It's not a backfill. Thank you. Right. Right. It's yeah, and, and and I appreciated that observation. I, I I think we've used the term quite a lot, and that wasn't an interpretation that had occurred to us that that uh, it could be seen that way. But the idea is that we're not trying to 
refill our depleted coffers. Oh, you're right. In a substance Bring way. revenue in line with cost increases. Okay, exactly. Right. So when we say right. catch up, we're really talking so about catching up. So it's a realignment. Yeah, that's I like that. probably a good term. And I'm just, I'm, the reason I, I bring it up in this setting is that I'm I'm worried that others might be watching this and not think, not understand that this is the fee that's increasing. Mm -hmm. Correct. For the services provided. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we really are looking at right sizing the yes. fee to the staffing that it requires to do the necessary work and then right sizing all of our operations and processes as well. Those are my comments. But there, uh okay no that was the surcharge okay commissioner fi how about you great presentation i think a lot of good questions have been asked and this is our second time something triggered my allergies so i've been like oh, no. quietly sneezing here for i don't know the last 30 minutes um but I'm okay now. I think it's calming down. The mask is helping. Um, I I think the question I had, um, great presentation, Aaron. I'm wondering, um, and I was thinking about like last time you came here and did the presentations, there's gonna be an impact to the developers to these feature, and then there's impact to our residents as well who I apply our services and have to pay. I'm wondering if there's going to be next time you come back, I didn't notice it in your next steps, is there going to be an equity analysis uh, of what the impact will look like to between the different groups? Um, but so far, so good. That is something we've talked about, and I know that was brought up before. Um, we have talked about looking through our fees in terms of line items and finding out if any are um, going to be you know, way out of proportion with how much work that actually requires, and then if there's an, some kind of an equity concern with that particular use um, or fee that somebody would need to pay. And so we've done a little bit of that work already. We do have a hardship um, relief program available to people, which hasn't been used very much, but it is something that is possible for people if they can show a certain income level, then they can pay a reduced rate um, for some of some of our development activities. Um, and then additionally, we have talked about, it's come up in other venues where we've talked about this, is things like regulated affordable housing and different opportunities for how we can help to reduce that burden. Um, and this may not be necessarily the vehicle to do that because Again, we know we just need to match this with the level of staffing um, that we need in order to perform the activities. But I think these are all really good points to consider and certainly something we can do some more research on. Thank you. Uh, the other thing I was wondering um, was around your third bullet point around developing a draft policies for annual fee indexing mm -hmm. and fund balance targets. And I... I guess it applies to all of these. Uh, your next steps is when, so this is just a curious question. You probably have it planned out and <laughs> figured out the answer, but I'm wondering in my head, um, is there, when do we notify this is happening to the people that this is gonna happen to? And is what's the timeline by the time it comes to our board is there an engagement process that happens to communicate to about this coming and that way? And then it comes to us. So is there? Yeah, so if you go to slide 21, please. And this one's titled LUT Next Steps. Mm -hmm. So after today, getting feedback from your board, um, and we would refine, take take all this feedback in, develop work on developing policies, Commissioner. If I think what you're speaking to is the yeah, I feel that, like I'm the about ongoing the stakeholder yeah. stakeholder outreach. We would move directly into that, and then bring this back to your board prior to the budget. Okay. Or um, it wouldn't be part of the fee schedule, but kind. Of, we got to work on the you might have been out of the room yep. when we went over this earlier. No, I said, OK, uh, yeah, so I saw that. I'm just wondering the time. The board so that we can we can You're circle back with mm -hmm. the development community and other stakeholders on the fee adjustment um, before um, June. Of this year. OK, that's what I, I was wondering. I saw that bullet point, but I was wondering, like, exactly how was it going to happen? Mm -hmm. so, 
Thank you. <laughs> so that listening session you talked about is January 19th? Yes. Yep. And you talked about uh, continuing conversations, particularly with regard to the building services provided to the three local communities as well. So uh, that in between our meeting today and our direction today, you would continue to refine the, um, the fee schedule, continue to do the refinement of the technology surcharge, uh, work on the annual fee indexing. So you're going to be coming back and getting our thumbs up on all of that uh, before you go through the remainder of your budget development. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's a lot of work in the next couple of months. It is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And uh, and our budgets are due in early February. So we're really focusing on trying to move forward quickly and efficiently. Yep. Yeah. Yep. OK, well, um, I have a different page uh, for starting my questions, and it's on Slide 10, which is the LUT assessment recommendation. And I think I had the same question uh, at our December work session uh, with the consultant, and I either don't remember the answer or I still don't get it. It's under sustainable funding, the last bullet, considering ongoing external funding support for current planning functions that do not generate fee revenue. I don't get it. What slide is on? It's slide it the one up on the screen. So there are a number of activities that current planning staff do that are not directly related to a particular development application. That's things like folks calling and saying, what is the zoning on my property? Can I uh, build an ADU in my backyard? Can I expand my garage? And what are my setback requirements? Just kind of general uh, customer assistance type questions. People oftentimes walk in and want to ask a question at the counter. Because that time the staff person is spending is not connected to a particular development activity, we don't charge the person on the phone $100 to ask that question, for example, um, that ends up not being a fee generating activity. Because of that, many jurisdictions do heavily subsidize their current planning activity, and that's what we saw on that jurisdiction comparison chart. The consultant recommended it because it is generally a best practice for jurisdictions because some of those activities don't generate costs, and so it was recommended. We, however, know that that just hasn't been the paradigm here at the county. Current planning has been fee supported in the past, and so while it was recommended, that's not something that we built into our uh, budget scenarios going forward, other than the code enforcement subsidy that we've received in the past and assumed we would continue to receive in the future. Okay. Okay. All righty, so um, thank you for helping me get that. Uh, so as you've noted here, but noted a little lightly, uh, we've taken actions to date on the incremental fee increases in two prior fiscal years. A lot of this is go, goes towards the comment that in my words, it's telling the story. Commissioner Rogers highlighted, we've done a lot of work. This should not be a surprise to anyone that we're having to increase fees because for those two fiscal years, we went through these uncomfortable conversations, put those reserve funds into action to navigate through difficult times and waters. The long and short of it, though, is that we burn through those costs are higher than current revenue schedules, and we have to make changes. So I just want to uh, support uh, my colleagues' uh, message of telling that story of how far we've come and where we find ourselves because you have practiced that cost containment. Mm -hmm. And you and all the members of the team have really uh, stepped up to the plate, have put in that extra pound of flesh. Uh, and I don't want 
staff to be carrying the impact any longer. I don't want people to be overloaded any longer. I don't want staff morale to be low because of our inability to put cost coverage into practice. So this is where I have a little bit of difficulty with the staff recommended 40%, 10%. Um, because we've, we've gone the incremental route. And I think if for no other reason than to our staff, that we, the board, have to send a clear signal that it is a new era now. Uh, thank you for bearing with. Thank you for trying to provide cost coverage as we looked to minimize cost impacts to the building industry, to constituents over these past two budget years. But we can't do that any longer. And this will be a little softer or a little better received through that story of cost containment actions to date that you've already, that you have already um, implemented, um, but that others may not be as familiar with. So towards this theme of a clean new era, I believe strongly that we need to do this to support our workforce in LUT, but also for our workforce across the agency and to send the clear signal. So at a, much like Commissioner Treese mentioned, at a minimum, I can see myself supporting the 4010. I would prefer the 50% increase because I believe we must Implete, implement these FTE increases, and we must get the programs at break even. We've already tried to soften it for two years, and we just can't keep doing that. Um, so that's my preference but I realize you're gonna go through some additional outreach and I appreciate the specific suggestion that Commissioner Treese made. And frankly, um, I, am, I don't think we can, um, I appreciated your answer on to Commissioner Fye's question on equity analysis. I see no way for us to delay any any fees. Uh, I really don't. Um, I appreciate the next steps you're going to go through. And my last comment is to something that was touched on and is assumed, but I feel is independent of these fee schedules. And it is for uh, the utilization of general fund revenues, as I believe sourced through gain share and SIP funds of 325K per year for code enforcement. This board has not had the opportunity to weigh in on uh, gain share SIP policy investment decisions. We have been in a position of just continuing what was decided on over five years ago. Um, and share that that code compliance funding. It's uh, it's about twenty five thousand dollars from the general fund and about three hundred thousand from video lottery. Okay, okay. So it's not from good share. Right. No, it's from video lottery. Great. But I want to make sure that this board has the opportunity to go over those gain share SIP funds. Uh, I know our hands are tied in terms of the revenue bond coverage for the um, event center, 
but I believe we do need to revisit the policy direction and make sure that we have a direction that is applicable for the 2020s that we find ourselves in. We may stick with the same thing, but we still need to have the opportunity. So don't need to add another budget item to it, um, but I'm hoping at a minimum through our round tables, we'll have bandwidth for that. Um, I can maybe do a little bit better than your round table. On January 10th, we do have a gain share time held um, for finance and government relations to come back before your board. And we'll be bringing that information as a first review, a first discussion. I think what your question also um, does um, bring up is just how has the county spent its lottery funds in the past? I mean, various funding sources that um, through... Um, uh, the budget position we find ourselves in, I think all of those funding sources need to look at and what priorities and um, uh, revenues expenditures we've used in the past. Yep. Yeah, there's been a lot of earmarking versus using a one Washington County approach. So uh, we may choose to continue some some uh, aspects uh, on an interim year to year basis until we get to our larger strategy, uh, which will, will take a while. So that covers, covers my thoughts on LUT as well. So um, I believe you've gotten direction from a majority to move yes, forward question. with- uh, Just to follow up on something that you said, okay. uh, and the Pam said on the 50% all at once, I'd like to see what that snapshot looks like. I candidly refer to that as ripping the band-aid off. So um, so I'd be like I'd like to see what how that changes some of your planning in here because you're gonna get the 10% early. Um, and then um, I this, thought they covered that. I didn't it's, I didn't see something um, where they went 50%. Yeah it's it, not in the charts. it's not in the uh, slideshow but in the memo that's yeah. attached from LUT you'll you'll see um, both for current planning and building we we showed similar charts for the 50% the 4010 and the 35 18. Okay. Yeah. I apologize I did not no, see no. that. So that is on right. what page of the report? Oh, um, golly. 138 yes. and 139 are the charts. Okay. It really has to deal with uh, break even mm -hmm. timeframes is the most notable uh, because for me, it comes from a standpoint of resiliency. Mm -hmm. And as a side note, I pulled out the prior budget uh, summaries that had the, the recession curves and looking at uh, yes, we've had inflation, right? That's hitting us in terms of our cost. But I also thought about the different types of recessions that we've had because the economists have projected that we'll have previously that we, previous to the COVID recession, right? That we would have more frequent but smaller recessions as had previously, so I was able to go back to the 1990s model that's in there. Sorry, I left the sheet upstairs on my desk as that reminder page for myself because my brain doesn't have room for everything. Um, and so that's another reason why, uh, yes, even though with the annual index fee, even with the technology fee, I felt that um, implementing that additional 10% sooner rather than later might minimize that increase over time. So, but I, okay. I'm not saying I'm dead set on one or the other, but rather want to get feedback and, um, and, and have that option still open for the next step. Okay. I will take a look then at that document. I'm not a big fan of 140 page documents, but, um, and then just one other thing is, uh, Back in the 90s, uh, our CPA firm implemented a technology fee. It was a flat-based fee. It was X amount of dollars per tax return. Had you considered a flat rate fee versus the 5 to 7%? I mean, obviously, you've got a targeted dollar amount that you think you need to get to. What would that look like if we did a flat-based fee? Is it for, for me, 
it's easier to look at that and say, okay, I get that mm -hmm. rather than, well, wait a minute, I got this jimongous project. And so it's going to generate a bazillion dollars of fees and I got 5% added on that. So I don't know, maybe it would work, maybe it wouldn't, but just, just a thought. Well, certainly something we can look at a little bit more. Yep. That's all. Thank you, Chair. I appreciated how you um, you gave us the example of a ten unit. Mm -hmm. uh, the lot. Yes. Yeah. So. Remember, Stephen. I must have looked at this. This is like this thing. <laughs> way too much. Information. We're trying to understand. Lots. This is a lot. Power right. of the work <laughs> that you've all brought forward to us. So well, we very much appreciate your attention to this. We know you have many competing priorities and and uh, so we So that's it, it on part one. Yeah. yeah, can I just make one last comment before we move on? I just want to express appreciation and many of you had said um recognize staff during this. And I just want to take a moment to recognize the LUT staff, both from leadership and all of the employees um, on these teams who have been working through some really turbulent times, um, working through the assessment, a degree of uncertainty um, that has got brought us to this really kind of important moment to design the future on where we're going. Um, so just thank you for your leadership. And I do want to ensure that they have worked significantly on cost containment and also process improvement. So just huge kudos. And I'm sure you'll take that back to the team. We will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You bet. So onward to health and human services, the environmental health program. So we take five before we jump into this. Uh, actually, why don't we reconvene at three? Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for bearing with us. So, Sorry, Mira. <laughs> ah, it was a fake.
Okay, thank you, Mr. Thumbs Up, Clerk Moss. So we're back for the program cost recovery proposals. This time, part two, or I refer to it as part two of two parts, the Health and Human Services Environmental Health Program. Welcome, Mira Samanto and Mar Marie Bowman Davis. Thank you so much, Chair Harrington, Board of County Commissioners. Um, so again, my name is Mira Samantal, Interim Director of Health and Human Services. With me, I have Marie Bowman Davis, our Public Health Division Manager. I also want to note some subject matter experts in the audience um, to support with any Q&A at the end. So we have John Kawaguchi, who's our Environmental Health Services Supervisor, sitting in the back. Um, we also have Nor Delon, our HHS Administrative Services Manager. So um, if you have specific questions later, I might be calling on them to support us as well. Don't worry. There we go. Don't let LUT be any indication. <laughs> <laughs> this is the place for us to sort through questions and answers. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chair. Um, so today I just want to note that um, we are providing a really high level overview um, of our proposed proposed cost recovery. Let me just, sorry, let me get to the correct slide here. There we go. Um, very high level overview of our cost recovery option for environmental health program fees for fiscal year uh, 23 to 24. Uh, so for your reference and for the public's awareness, I do wanna call attention to your board agenda packet. And I know it's a lengthy packet as we talked about earlier, uh, but there is a memo from our staff and a final report from Marina and Company, which is our consultant that we've been working with uh, that provides further detail on the background and process uh, for this fee proposal that we'll be reviewing today. Um, so the extra details in there. Uh, we do hope that today's presentation will answer most of your questions, but again, um, we welcome those opportunities for clarification and to work through any questions you have um, as we go along. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Marie, who's gonna start us off with um, kind of our background in fee setting landscape. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, for the record, Marie Bowman Davis, she, her, hers, Public Health Division Manager and your board's uh, appointed local public health administrator. Uh, so, here in um, Washington County, Oregon, uh, you, this um, Washington County serves as the uh, local public health authority uh, and as such has statutory responsibilities, including licensure of, <clears throat> excuse me, tourist accommodations, um, licensure of pools and spas and restaurant licensure, uh, including mobile units and vending machines. And so as part of the duties of the LPHA, uh, the Board of County Commissioners, your board serves uh, as the local, uh, the governing body of the LPHA. And um, under these duties, you have the ability to adopt schedules of fees for public health services that are reasonably calculated to not exceed the cost of the services performed. Adoption of the fees uh, occur typically during the county budget process. Uh, approved fees are collected by the Environmental Health Program in the Public Health Division of the Department of Health and Human Services. So um, up to today, uh, up to this fiscal year, our existing methodology and tool for fee setting within environmental health predates our current staff. And over time, there's been a loss of institutional knowledge related to the fee setting methodology. Therefore, this past year, Health and Human Services um, took their challenges and um, their understanding of fee schedules and how they're produced and uh, contracted with Marina and company. Uh, this has um, helped us to develop a new tool with available data and how to determine any cost recovery um, and uh, help us better project with um, impacts such as um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So our new tool, um, as uh, Mira mentioned, is available in the summary, uh, sorry, the report about the tools available in the memo. Um, there are several spreadsheets and uh, this tool was conducted through an independent assessment of the environmental health program to determine appropriate fees, to capture the cost of regulatory functions um, for the budget, future budget years. We have a data dictionary uh, that goes with the tool and uh, it provides recommendations for our fee setting methodology. Uh, as part of the efforts of Marina and Company, they researched and reported on how other counties set their fees, known as benchmarking, which Mira will talk to uh, in just a few minutes. Um, they've also included how to incorporate an equity lens in the fee setting schedule 
advantages and disadvantages of supplementing fees with general fund and uh, overall our goal was to align with the GFOA best practices and ensure fee setting process is equitable and transparent. So uh, our environmental health fees are created in alignment with Oregon advised administrative rules and Oregon revised statutes, as well as other state guidance. Uh, some fees have rates set by um, the statutes and others are a little bit more flexible. So in total, the environmental health program collects approximately 200 fees across three budget reporting categories uh, that we have pools and tourists, restaurants, and other food licensing. So historically, each year, HHS has made incremental fee increases, averaging about 3 to 5% uh, using the available methodology. These fees have been collected in a general fund account which does not provide an opportunity for reserves or fund balance for environmental health. As you can see on the chart uh, on the screen, the revenues from fees have not covered expenses, which results in ongoing general fund subsidy requests. This fiscal year, we have budgeted uh, uh, 200, uh, a little over 230,000 in general fund subsidy for fiscal year 22-23 to cover our current gap between revenue and expenditures. Um, as our CFO, Greg Munn, mentioned earlier today, the county is in the process of updating the strategic plan and fi financial policies to redesign the budget process, and we are hoping that our proposed fees using our new tools will align well. Can I see? I'm, I'm not understanding yeah. the right column on that, three million, two and a half million, two million versus the left column. So I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm missing something you're trying to... Connect. Sure. Uh, on the left side and... Um, we have our subject matter expert, John, in the room, just in case. Uh, so what you have, the bar graphs on the bottom represent the general fund subsidy mm -hmm. that has supported our revenues and our expenditures. So that gap between um, our budgeted revenue, which is the orange line, and the budgeted expenditures, which is the blue line, that gap is where general fund has been filling for all of these. I get that. I'm talking about the clear to the right side of that graph where it says $3 million, two and a half million, two million. What is that column? Because on the left side is two and a half to one and a half. So what's the difference between those, the left side and the right side? Good observation, John. The yeah, they, they, that is an <laughs> excellent catch. That was the typo you mentioned earlier. Oops. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> you I, I get the prize? Yes, you get the prize. Uh, ah, you got the error. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I have one thank thing you. too. In your presentation, are you going to explain what the general fund subsidy was covering? The general fund, what does the general fund subsidy You don't have to do it now cover? in your presentation. I want to know, yeah, what, what that's covering. So the general fund subsidy has been covering the difference between the expenditures and the revenues and predominantly it's staff. No, purely it's not a program or set of programs. It's no, no, it's the whole category. Yeah, it, it, it's the entire entire package for environmental health. Um, so it, the general fund subsidy that we're presenting here is for schools and tourists, restaurants, and other food licensing, which are three reporting categories in the overall environmental health program. This does not pay for the environmental health program as a whole. This is just three budget reporting categories. All right. Is that, yes? Yeah, no, that's fine. I just didn't know if you, it was one particular program or two oh. or whether it was a grouping or- Yes, thank you. explained, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yes, if we, if we identified each of these budget reporting categories as a program, within the environmental health program, then it would be three programs. Because it's important to know what fee increases are based upon what is being subsidized. So if a program has a big subsidized, it'd be nice to know that. Some might be breaking even. And and we will explain a little bit more later um, just kind of what, what we do within each of those budget categories. But no, that's a, that's a great question. And again, apologies for uh, for the numbers not matching on the left and the right of the slide and excellent Thank catch, you. Commissioner Willie. Yes, and that is a cumulative uh, summary of general fund across the three categories. So um, thank you for the additional questions. So my last slide that I have before I turn it over um, to Mira is our fee assessment process. So we are going to provide a little bit more information about our new fee assessment process. Uh, we did task Marina and company with the determining appropriate fees to fully capture cost recovery for future budget years, to develop the data dictionary to go with each of the tools, uh, to provide recommendations for the fee setting methodology and incorporate an equity lens. 
uh, within the requirement list, uh, we needed to ensure that our costs uh, would be compliant. So again, meeting the statutory and code requirements, um, that they were based on accurate and reliable data, they were able to forecast and make projections, uh, that they were informing decision making. So um, the tool comes with a, uh, an ability to, um, as you'll see on later slides, to differentiate between full cost recovery or any uh, general fund subsidy at any proportion uh, or percentage directed by your board. Uh, we um, have considered equity in the budgeting process. Um, for example, well, Mira will talk about that later. Uh, it is, the tool is easy to understand. It's easy to use. Um, it's adaptable. Uh, we can replicate it. Uh, it's transparent. We can show all of the um, assumptions that went into the model and the exact numbers. So um, as a result, um, we well, during the process, we had to reverse engineer the existing tool and then uh, had to update and create a new uh, simplified methodology, um, which is included in your memo. So I will turn it over to Mira. Okay, thank you, Marie. Um, so just wanted to go over a few assumptions that we incorporated um, as we developed our model. Um, so to develop our estimated fees and understand the impacts to those fees, um, we also made these assumptions that personnel salary information loaded into Questica, so into, into our budget documents, is a snapshot from December of 2022. So that's an assumption that we incorporated. Uh, we assumed flat rate for materials and supplies from fiscal year 22. 23. Uh, we used facility counts from this current fiscal year, and then we uh, added uh, projected for some growth, so added a small projection for growth for facility counts. We assumed the same overhead rate uh, for fiscal year 22-23 into um, this new fee model, and then we also um, assumed the same state remittance fees per our intergovernmental agreement um, with the state. So when we use the tool and we incorporate all of these assumptions, that's what's going to populate into the fee increases that we're going to go over next. Also want to add some additional considerations um, that I think it's important for this board to be aware of. Um, so we don't have final numbers today. As you know, we're in the middle of our budgeting process. We're not at the end of our budgeting process. So we're still waiting on some finalized um, things from county finance. Um, so 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 personnel modifiers, personal expenses are still being finalized right now that could impact our budget numbers. Um, we also haven't had an opportunity to assess our material and supply needs in alignment with the county budget equity tool. So we're all as departments going through the process of our budget equity tool. So things like interpretation and translation, those types of things could impact our fees. It's still in process. Um, also, there's several changes um, to this year's budget process, as you've heard about um, from our county um, administrative team, from our CFO, we're redesigning our budget process. So new internal service funds, use of full cost of the full, sorry, use of full cost county cost plan, um, and our budget add and reduction packages as a department. So those assumptions and those considerations are just important to note. So what we're presenting today is really um, the best information we have moving forward, but they are estimates at this point in time. They're not finalized numbers. So what are we recommending? What fin financial impacts do we expect to see? So for fiscal year 23-24, HHS staff are recommending budgeting for 100% cost recovery model, which estimates a general fund subsidy savings of approximately 260,000. And this again is to minimize our general fund subsidy. That's the goal and progress towards full cost recovery based on GFOA best practices. Uh, these proposed fees align with statutory requirements as Marie talked about at the start of the presentation. They were informed by benchmarking with other counties as part of Marina and Company's assessment and process. And again, our in alignment with uh, GFOA best practices. Oops, sorry, not done with this slide quite yet. Um, also, it's important to note that Marina and Company, um, they, the tools and calculated fees um, that they reviewed used abbreviated public health equity assessment um, found in the public health division. So there was an equity lens to the work that they did. The tool includes a series of questions um, that we ask about proposals, decisions, projects, or programs um, that public health is planning, developing, or supporting. Um, so the calculations for fees resemble what we call a targeted universalism approach to 
cost recovery. Targeted universalism means that individual fees are increased proportionate to associated costs instead of a flat increase. This offers a more equitable approach to fee increases. So as you can see on this slide, what you see is the impact of the proposed fee increase would result in fee increases of approximately a range of five to 14%, depending on the type of fee. So remember, there's over 200 different fees in EHS. So with the targeted universalism approach, we're not doing a flat rate and we're gonna see this range. So an example here, so you'll see uh, that first, those first two columns, the blue and the orange, a restaurant. So think of maybe a Stanford's, for example, a restaurant with over 150 seats, their fee would increase from 1,034 per year to 1,293, um, so an increase of $259, and that's for a full 12 months. A class four food cart, so there's four different kinds of food carts. Um, so this would be the type that serves a full menu, not just um, serving something that's pre-prepared, but actually serving a full menu. Their fee would increase from 701 to 764 for a full year or a $63 increase. A hotel with over 100 units, so perhaps think of uh, an embassy suites or something similar, their fee would increase from $429 a year to $526 a year or a $97 increase. A child care center, um, such as a Head Start location, would increase from $375 a year to $407 a year or a $32 increase. So as you can see, there's a wide range. And again, these are estimates based on all of the information we have now and the assumptions that we just went over. Um, so again, the staff recommendation is 100% um, cost recovery, but for the board's consideration, we are including two other budget options. I'm including a 95% cost recovery model and a 90% cost recovery model. Um, those would be possible glide paths um, as we transition to full cost recovery. Um, so I'm gonna go over three graphs on the three graphs on the next three slides um, that's gonna go over three options for each budget category. So as Marie mentioned, we have three budget categories, restaurants, pools and tourists and other food. Um, and Commissioner Rogers will kind of explain a little bit more about each of those categories, which I think you were asking about earlier. Um, I'll pause there, though, just to make sure there's no clarification so far, because I know it's a lot of information. Okay. Um, so again, recommendations. So option one would be 100% cost recovery. So what you're going to see on this slide and then next to the orange bar the chunky orange bar is, is the estimated revenues. So the orange is the estimated revenues. The thin black line at the top, and I apologize, I know it's a little thin, so hopefully the public can see that. Uh, the thin black line at the top is estimated expenditures. The smaller yellow bar, you'll only see it on the options two and three at the 95% and 90 level is the estimated general fund subsidy. So that would be the amount of general fund needed to cover the gap between revenues and expenditures. on this slide. Um, so restaurants, um, for example, um, as I talked about on the earlier slide, this would show an estimate of 11% average increase or $119 on average, uh, depending on the size, if we moved to 100% cost recovery. And just explaining what happens in this category. So to protect the public's health, Washington County Environmental Health licenses and inspects restaurants, food carts, and other food service facilities to make sure they follow Oregon Department of Human Services food sanitation rules to help prevent and address foodborne illness. So we also provide education and food service operate uh, to, for, to food service operators and issue food handlers card. So there's lots that, um, of things that staff do in this category and that is the full cost recovery model is for all those services within that budget. Can you stop a minute with that? Yeah. How about institutions? I mean, hospitals have, hospi have food service. You have schools who have food service. You have a lot of people who have food service. Would those apply to them as well? Sure. Or how does that work? The schools, yes. Child care centers, yes. Hospitals, looking to John. Uh, excuse me. So the hospitals, when they're open to the public, we do license and inspect those. So um, the part of the kitchen where it only serves the uh, patients, we do not um, license or inspect. That is per staff mm -hmm. per law. It's not retail businesses. We're looking at a lot of folks. Yeah. And our program, again, spans across the entire county, not just on the focus area. So the second part of his question was on school cafeterias. Would you like to step the, forward? Yeah. Would you like to step forward? Mm -hmm. Come to the mic for the public. <laughs> Thank you, John. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, John Kawaguchi, he, him. 
um, pro environmental health program supervisor. So in response to the uh, institutions and then also for the um, hospitals, the other, they, we, they presented three programs. And so the other food program is where the National School Lunch Program is captured. So we do have a um, contract with Oregon Department of Education to perform the inspections for the National School Lunch Programs. Will they decrease though? She will, I think that probably might, might be in the next slide up here. Yeah, <laughs> so it's coming, so. Should have looked at that, okay. <laughs> I'm just going to have John stay up here in case there's questions. So yes, excellent question. So we, we talked about the three different buckets. So I just started with the restaurants. Okay. So going next um, to the pools and tourists, um, and I'll just tell you what's included here because I think that'll get to the question. So um, this would be... Um, next slide. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so this would be, we have over 660 licensed swimming pools and spas. So program staff inspects public swimming pools and spas to minimize the risk of illness and to reduce safety hazards resulting in accidents. Tourist facilities include travelers accommodations, hostels, picnic parks, recreation parks, and organizational camps. So Washington County Environmental Health licenses and inspects all tourist facilities in the county to protect the health and safety of the public. Uh, these inspections include evaluation of the facility's water supply, sewage disposal, plumbing, toilet facilities, garbage disposal, insect and rodent control, swimming pools, laundry rooms, and food service. So on this slide, yes, go ahead, Commissioner Tree. How many, how many licensed pools were there again? What did you say, 600? 660, wow. over 660. And those are licensed, not personal? Correct. Correct. Uh -huh. So on this slide, you'll see in the 100% cost recovery option, again, you're going to see that's even with the black line. Um, in option two and three, so for instance, if you were to look at option three at the 90% um, cost recovery model, um, we would need approximately $38,484 in general fund subsidy if we were to do a glide path and look at 90% instead of 100. At the 95%, again, you're looking at just a little over 19,000 um, in general fund subsidy. And then the last one, and this is um, Commissioner Rogers where your question was, so what's included in other foods? So in this category, we are looking at childcare facilities and schools. So for instance, you would have a $15,000 uh, estimated general fund subsidy if we were to look at the 90% level, a little over 7,000 or close to 8,000 for the 95% level. Um, let me just make sure. So, and, and in terms of the child care, um, John, do you want to mention anything about anything else in this category that I missed? Child care in schools, is there anything else? Okay, okay, great. So um, just to summarize, so what we're looking at is if we move forward with 100% cost recovery for fiscal year 23-24, we estimate a general fund subsidy savings of approximately $260,000. And again, this moves us towards full cost recovery, um, you know, really as a philosophy within our department and as a county. Um, and we're maximizing our cost recovery and following those GFOA best practices. Uh, staff are gonna be continuing to work on refining and preparing our fee schedule. Again, the assumptions we had and some of the things that we don't know for sure yet are gonna be incorporated. And of course, we're looking for the board's feedback today and, and how you feel about this, this presentation. We also are gonna be obtaining a feedback during the upcoming public health advisory council meeting that's coming up um, right around the corner on January 10th. Um, so that is our presentation. I know it's a lot of information and in a lot of the details, again, we're in those attachments. So we welcome your questions if there's anything we can um, explain further for you. Question on, are irrigation systems like home irrigations, are they inspected by you? Because there is a fees. I know that you pay to have somebody come out and do that. Is that are we affecting, I'm trying to fig figure out how many people are all impacted by this. You're thinking about the backflow. Yeah, you're exactly right, the sprinkler system. Uh, Commissioner, no. Uh, excuse me, Washington County and Vermont does, do not uh, inspect those. So um, my understanding is the municipalities with their drinking water programs, that each district, they'll, um, so when you submit the certification that your backflow prevention um, device was checked, that goes straight to the city or the municipality that has that um, water district. Tiger 12, but we don't do it in the county, so if you're, no. no. TV, w, T, right, 12 so Valley 
water district, district does it for the unincorporated state of Hillsboro water district and <laughs> so all the different water districts I believe are the ones that um, yeah. ensure or requires you to as a resident to um, have your backflow prevention devices checked thank you yep so a lot of information, a lot of analysis has been done. Thank you for both the um, slide overview as well as uh, the detailed memo our Washington County staff has provided as well as the consultant. It's, it's very clear to me that uh, you've done a lot of due diligence to look at the different kinds of fees, different circumstances. Mm -hmm. So commissioners, what questions and comments do you have? And I'll remind you of the policy questions that are, there you go. Um, so we have uh, the fee increases here uh, with HHS. I'm not, uh, Vera, I need a reminder, you talked about there was a next step of going to the Public Health Advisory Committee, and I've lost. Uh, that's okay. That, uh, Chair Harrington, that wasn't on the slide, so that's probably why you don't see it. It was in the memo, yeah, um, I no. believe, so that is a next step, um, but you won't see it on the slide. Yep. So in terms of touch points, uh, you'll be going. It was also summarized in the worksheet. It. Uh, I think if I have this right, um, you'll uh, take the proposal to the advisory committee as well. And I'm wondering in terms of the touch point with the board and are giving a thumbs up, Ms. Angie, are you going to coordinate those on the same days or different sort of days? Because I know as mentioned, department budgets are due in early February. So I don't need the exact week. I just generally I'm wondering, is today our singular thumbs up or will there be another touch point? Um, we can um, uh, we can circle back with the board if your board would like another touch point on this item to include. But if um, we could feedback, today, that, that would be just. If, if you could today um, from building um, their budget, I know HHS would appreciate it in conversation with um, the HHS team. However, they can be flexible to meet your needs. Okay. Okay. Well, let's see how we end up. Okay. Commissioners, feedback. Who wants to go first? Go ahead, right. Commissioner Trees. Has been has been said, lots of information here and, and really good detail. I'm in support of 100%, you know, what the staff recommendation is. And I think that the, the increases are different than the LUT increases because you've been, you've been progressing over the years. So it's not a, a, a giant shock. So I'm, I'm fine with that and I'm fine with the 100%. I am really concerned about why I don't know that there are 660 <laughs> pools <laughs> spas in this county because I just went through what I would think and I've come up with maybe 200 at the most. Um, just a comment, because there hasn't been any outbreaks on pools and spas because we've been doing our work. Oh, nice work, Don. There you go. There you go. Pools and spas. Yeah, I know, but the spa, no. well, some facilities like there's a Health club near Health me clubs. that has multiple pools, but right. they also have those spa pools. Mm -hmm. And so those each count as one? Uh, no. So yeah, each one is one. So yes. yeah. the only pools and spas per statute are your private residential spas or, or pools that we do not license and inspect. So the clubs where there's yeah. like, you know, there's a number of them with I mean, like eight, fitness. ten Still and pools. Have trouble with six hundred. Each one of those are seven. And then the amount of apartments and condos mm -hmm. and hotels. A lot of those have yeah. pools and spas, Ooh. so that's where okay. the number starts okay. adding up. Okay, so now I get you. All right. <laughs> yep. Okay, who would like to go next? Go ahead. I think it's interesting that that was Pam's biggest concern. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so could we go to slide twenty-four? If only we had over six hundred and sixty childcare providers. No, no, no kidding. <laughs> and we may. But there you go. Yeah, I'll solve a lot of problems. Oh, if you've got, go right ahead. Oh, I was going to say that. So with child care providers, um, 
per statute, uh, they're not required to utilize the public health um, inspections. So it's a safety and sanitation inspection. And in Washington County, there's about 600 or so plus or minus um, providers. We have of the 600 or so, we um, do inspect about a third of them total because again, they're not required to utilize our services. They can use private inspectors. And so a lot of them, many of them do because of the, the cost and overhead, what it costs to hire a private inspector. So yeah, there's over about, about 600. I want it to be higher. We, we need it. Yes, we need it to be higher. That's right. Anyway, go ahead, Commissioner Willie. I didn't mean okay. to interrupt. No, that's fine. That was a good question. Uh, so on slide 24 here, as you pointed out, the bottom line is the gray general fund subsidies. Mm -hmm. Why does it fluctuate so much to a minimum of 129,000 in 2021 to 322,000 just the next year? And so what is what is causing these huge fluctuations in general fund subsidy? John, I think you can take this one. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's part of the reason why we hired the consultant, uh, because a lot of the um, this actual uh, workbooks that were created were before I started here. And, and um, even when I uh, started here about 10 years ago, Nor's predecessor um, did not create that either. And so, and he didn't know exactly how it worked. So that's part of the reason why um, we wanted to go with a consultant to kind of identify um, the input that we're putting, that we're entering, and then what the outcomes were, because you would think it would be closer than that. So there are a lot of questions to um, why there's so many of variability. Um, part of it is depending on from year to year, what kind of projections we had on the growth of the county or as far as the number of facilities. Um, the last couple of years were really challenging because of COVID. Um, we we in discussions um, or collaborations with other neighboring counties, we had, we all said, well, we'll just kind of calculate roughly a 20% reduction or what we felt was gonna be a reduction because of COVID people closing or operators closing. So we reduced our um, revenue because of that, thus creating you know more need for general funds. So as part of it is that, um, and then part of it is, is, is the uh, staffing personnel costs and benefits, you know, Somewhere else within those last five years, there's been a spike or increase in, in benefits and, and um, personnel costs. So some of that is um, occurs after we try to calculate or project our revenue. So therefore that really hits us hard too with actually the need for more general, general fund. So if I would go into our budget document, would I find more detail as to, I guess I'm having trouble. I'm having a little trouble with the huge fluctuations. I'm having trouble with not understanding what exactly the cost drivers are to that. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like I need to see a p and l, which is probably not a good thing for me to have to look at. but um, but yeah, i'd I'd like to see a little bit more granular de detail on why these huge fluctuations. And then we, you know, you've added up uh, the the hundred percent versus the 90%, and it looks like, what is it, 260,000 is the delta projected if we don't do 100%. So basically what you're telling me is, historically we've been doing about 90%, so we've been a 10% shortfall every year, okay? Um, so, okay, yeah, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to just see what the cost drivers are that that's creating these huge fluctuations. Um, because again, it's, we're, we're holding mm -hmm. all of the department headcount accountable. Um, we wanna know where they're spending their money for their departments and uh, what's causing mm -hmm. all of these shortfalls. And I, that's what I just wanna have a little better understanding before I just say, I'm good with 100%. So mm -hmm. I'm not ready to make that decision yet. I'm sorry, Tanya, I'd like to do that, but I'm not ready. Yeah, I think actually, Commissioner Willie, I'm going to invite Nora Delon up, our administrative services manager. Um, so I think she can describe a little bit, maybe not as in depth as you're looking for, but I think a little bit uh, more about uh, the variation and what has impacted that. And so it, maybe some of this information is in the 
this attachment has 62 pages to it and I did not read all 62 pages. So maybe it's in there somewhere. And if it is, I apologize. I'll do my homework better. But. And before I, I just verified that I do have a question here. Uh, the, the blue line on this chart and the orange line, shouldn't the uh, expenditures be greater than the revenue? It should be less. Okay, so that so I'm not going crazy. No. <laughs> okay, so those two numbers oh, are in reverse. <laughs> Good point. Okay. I thought the delta was the 233. And it is actually the 233 is the delta. It's just yeah, a good point. It's yeah, a, I, it, but I, I didn't, didn't understand. Look at the okay. Yeah, okay. You are correct. Yes, another another good catch. My apologies. We got that updated. And um, I just also want to point out that I appreciate that you've stated very clearly that the prior model, if I refer to the new yes. model and the older model, the older model was uh, not, it was hard to understand and all of the factors that went into it, how it worked and that you did your best uh, over the last few years to, to work on the projections to try and get it right. Yes. Um, but you were a bit challenged with the way that model works. And what I hear from you is with this new model, you're able to see the relationship between the fee use, the use for the services, and the cost coverage. Precisely, sure. So I've got it. Whew. Got it. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Now dive deeper, please. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nora Delon. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm the Administrative Services Manager for Health and Human Services. Thank you for having me today. Um, so I will share just, just what you uh, discussed, Chair, that, um, that over time we haven't had the historical knowledge to be able to see what exactly our drivers are. With this new tool, it will provide us with those inputs so that we have a sustainable model into the future to look at exactly what our drivers are, what we want to forecast into the future, and if we have any differences in our inputs. Um, so to answer your question about the fluctuations, definitely in 2021, um, COVID. So a lot of our restaurants closed. Um, there were huge changes in um, the environments in which we are working with. Um, but a big driver in our costs is personnel. And so, um, excuse me, I have a tickle in my throat. Um, and so one of the things that we're tasked with in environmental health and public health and HHS as a whole is um, the number of FTE that we have and the percent split of that FTE across various activities. So if you take a, a program like environmental health that has several layers of activities and trying to estimate the percent FTE in a snapshot in time that will be needed, uh, it's a difficult challenge. And so this tool really provides us with an opportunity to do a better job at that. Um, and so really we've looked at our actuals over time, uh, been able to put that into our tool and then looked at our budgeted forecast as well. So hopefully that helps. Um, there is some more detail in the report, but hopefully that helps with the framework. So we'll okay. leave it right there for the moment. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Rogers and Commissioner Fai, thoughts, questions, what have you? Sure. I don't have a lot. I'm, I'm for the 100%, uh, as you might guess, by the conversations. Uh, and then my only comment would be to do exactly what Luck said that they would do, and that would be to emphasize what efforts you're doing to uh, curtail costs. Because yeah. uh, I it's just too easy to pass costs on and, and, and not do any e e economy. Uh, the question I have, and maybe to, to Commissioner Willie's question, are all fees on an annual basis and do you have timing differentials? So our pools are inspected every year and if they are okay, then I don't understand why the fluctuations. If they're every couple of years, I can understand that. And do you have timing differences between the, for the COVID so that maybe things that you might have done in certain months, you had to delay several months, and so that would cause a, a timing difference in revenue. Mm -hmm. Up here. <laughs> so yes, uh, as far as per statutes, the fees are annual. 
uh, for for the restaurants for the temporary restaurant. I'm oh, sorry, not temporary for the restaurants um, and uh, mobile units. Those are required by law to be inspected twice a year. So once between January and June, and the second time between July and December. And then with pools and spas, there's some that are seasonal, and then there's some that are year round. So the seasonal ones, going referring back to the apartments, the ones that are outdoors, you know, in the climate or here in in, in Oregon, you, you can't really enjoy the pool year round. So some of those have a seasonal, which we inspect once a year. And then we have a year round ones that we do inspect once a year. So the ones that are indoors at um, Cherry Harrington's clubs <laughs> or the spa that can be open year round because they're nice and warm. So those, and then we have uh, the poor, the tourist and travel accommodations, those are inspected also once a year. Now your question as far as with the fees, uh, the license fees are all, they all expire at the end of the calendar year. So as of December 31st, they expire and we collect in January. So these fees will, excuse me, for FY 2324, those fees would be implemented in July 1st, 2023. So, you know, and what happened, you know, July, July of this year, we implemented our new fees or current fees and a majority of our collection or revenue will be collected now through, through the end of February. So as far as um, timing wise, it gets, it'll be approved. Um, we'll still collect it within that fiscal year, but it will be in the second half of the fiscal year. I think I understand you have a six to eight month lag between the Yes, the for majority of them, yes. We do have some that, excuse me, some any operators that open the day of they open the required to be inspected, they're required to meet minimum specification requirements. So they do get licensed when they open. It all depends if it's a renewal or if it's a change of ownership or if it's a new facility. Just comment that, that doesn't any of that explain his question. Because <laughs> you know, it, it, it helps us to understand when things are gonna happen, but right, right, right. Not the variations. Either. Not the variations, correct. Yeah, correct. No, okay, that's yeah. the variations. On subsidy goes more to the old model. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Does I don't know if it would be helpful to your board. Um, however, uh, up until this current fiscal year, with the modified base budget, um, that was a requested general fund subsidy. Um, it may have helped if we uh, put forward what the actual subsidy was, because any subsidy requested and unused uh, has the opportunity to be returned back to every at the end of it, every fiscal year. So it's it's not a those are not actuals of how much general fund was used. Yeah. There's proposed budget, adopted budget, and then actuals. Yeah. And we could go down a huge rabbit hole in this conversation. I do want to say this does um, also connect to our budget transformation. And as we call it, really uh, looking at our whole fund accounting structure and aligning our fund accounting structure um, based on the type of funds and type of use of, of those funds. That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> Commissioner Fai, how about you? Thank you. The question that Commissioner Rogers asked around the inspections and the, the, the fee, annual fee or whatnot, uh, the food cards, um, especially temporary events, uh, you charge those too, right? There is a fee requirement? Yes. And it's, okay. So the, the temporary um, type of food, um, temporary restaurant license where it's a, like the farmer's market right. or any kind of temporary event that pops up and they operate for the day or at the fair even, that's like a week or two week long period. Uh, those are event or activities for, for a certain period of time. So we inspect those at least once um, during their operation for the temporaries. The food carts or mobile food units, they also get inspected twice a year. So they get an annual license uh, and they get inspected twice a year. Again, as mentioned earlier, like a restaurant, once between January and June, and then a second time between July and December. And then those fees for the Saturday markets and farmers market will increase as well, right? Yes. 100% or the 90%, 95%. Right, it'll be incremental increase. depending on, again, the, from the, um, the data results from the marine and companies. Um, okay. uh, uh, workbooks that they created. So, and it, it, it really, you know, depending on the number of facilities and, and uh, where we're at as compared to um, what was used before in the previous workbook is how it would, everything were calculated. You know, the thought is moving forward, we can um, utilize this new workbook and then it'll be consistent throughout and we'll learn more about it, but the full 
you know, we'll have the information as far as where we can do 100% cost recovery, or we can look at options of 90 or 95% and present that to the board. Um, we have a better understanding of how it works versus um, the existing or the previous workbook that we used. Thank you. I think you guys did a really great job presenting. I thought it was going to be less, when I read the material, I thought, yes, LUT is going to be a bit more complicated, even though we've had a previous presentation and had an in-depth conversation. I thought yours was going to be less complicated, but then it morphed into this <laughs> conversation. But I thought you all did a really great job of presenting this information and synthesizing for us to understand and for the public that are viewing. The question, I don't even know if it's a question I had, but it really came from Aaron earlier. Um, one of the questions I asked around uh, and her comment, uh, one of the thing that she mentioned, and I'm gonna butcher the name of it, but it was a relief program for people who are gonna be financially impacted this fee increase. Is there such a thing that exists um, for, for the environmental health services? And I think that was the relief for hardship. Oh. Um. Excellent question, Commissioner Fai. And no, we we don't have that currently as an option um, in this model. And we don't, I don't even know if the statutes would allow us to do that either. That's a good point as well. We, if that we can't have, maintain it. We do have fee categories for um, benevolent organizations, community service um, type of um, businesses or, or uh, agencies or organizations like churches. Um, feeding sites. Uh, so they do, uh, we do have fees for those kind of operations, but we do not have any hardship at this point. And we're talking about public health here. Too. I, I just wanted to put this into context. Right. Yeah, one of the one of the things that I heard um, uh, in my um, participation with some festivals um, is people who want to take advantage of that day and make some money um, and share their goods and services. Um, it was the, the the fee to apply that one day service was cost. It was pretty costly for them. Or but people. So that those are the feedbacks that I heard. Um, and so I don't know what Washington County is. I think I remembered it. Uh, this is many years ago from Multnomah County. The festival was in downtown Portland. Uh, those festivals, but some of the vendors, food vendors, especially uh, the comments was the, the fee for the one day was too high and they would have appreciated the scaling system. So um, I, I never investigated if such thing existed in Multnomah County. I sort of said, oh, you should reach out to the public health of that department of that county to try to figure out to negotiate. But uh, that's why I mentioned the fee for service. This isn't any way reducing the, the public health expertise, what they're going to do, but it's just sort of alleviate some of that financial burden for people to participate in those. Thank you, Commissioner Fai. And I think um, we, I don't believe it's in the attachments, but we can definitely get you the exact num you know, the exact rates that would be proposed for, you know, more of a one day um event or a one week event so that you have that information. And this is where the sponsorship for such events being cities and service districts like THPRD can bear the cost of sponsor sponsoring those activities that we generally cannot do. Um, we would need to also do, um, as I believe one of the commissioners had mentioned, just uh, review statutorily because the fees need to align with the, the fee for the service. So if we would put into such of a um, cost curtailment uh, program, we would have to then increase the other fees to cover cover that whatever that cost gap would be. And that may not meet statutory requirements. Okay, well, um, Commissioner Fai, do you have any thoughts on the proposed 90, 95, 90% 90 options? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to, I think this is really great information to follow. I like to participate or hear the concerns or the questions in the Public Health Advisory Committee Absolutely. And, and give my feedback afterwards. So I'm not ready today. Thank you. I meant to say that earlier. <laughs> Understood. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, where, where are those questions in the thesis that you're referring to in here? Uh, no, uh, what questions? Yeah. 
So I'm, I missed. She like you is not ready to. I missed it. Well, I didn't say a question without. I can talk to you later. I can find that later. Okay. So for the benefit of time, because we've been at this a while longer than projected, um, I am uh, all set with moving forward with the 100% proposal. Okay. So you have a majority of three of us ready to move forward with that. Uh, I want to really give you a lot of credit uh, and shout out for the development of this new model. It included comparables from five different uh, county jurisdictions. So thank you very much for that information as well. You've really given us through this presentation quite a flavor of that range of 200 different fees and the extent of work that uh, your environmental health group does each and every day for all these different categories to ensure public health. Nobody likes an E. coli breakout, for example, or other infections that can happen through pools and spas, let alone food. So thank you for being so good at your jobs. Um, and also so mm -hmm. thorough in developing the new model. I have a suggestion. Uh, I did note if I internalized it correctly, uh, that different counties, uh, some adjust fees annually, others uh, like Marion County every three years. Um, so I would suggest uh, your gaining your year over year experience for two or three years with this new model. And yes, of course, year over year, you have the opportunity to refine it, but at least at a minimum after two or three years of full um, utilization, looking at how the fees changed in different categories year over year uh, and uh, see if the the new model with say a hundred percent is working smoothly enough for the plethora of customer bases that you work with. So I know it's work. I'm suggesting just make sure that uh, you have a system in I guess thinking this through, I want to ensure you have enough of a system in place to gather some customer feedback along the way so that you can then look back on that and right feedback is a gift. Those you don't hear from, you have to assume are satisfied enough, right? Uh, but does that three years out, does that tell you anything about how the model's been working? That's all. Thank you for the recommendation, Chair Harrington, and thank you for your time and attention. And this was a lot of information um, between two different departments, um, but we, we hope we did a good job of showing kind of that one Washington County approach moving towards that full cost recovery model with the GFOA best practices. Thank you for your 260,000 estimated of savings to help address the, what was it, $25 million gap at this point? We're so, getting there. Yep. yep. <laughs> Can I just circle back on next steps? Because we did really have um, two meaty topics this afternoon. Um, so we will be coming back to your board um, with um, the requested follow-up information for LUT, um, which really a focus on the stakeholder engagement that the team is going to be working on really quickly because we do want to get this in in front of your board um, hopefully at some point in February. We will also present to your board then the feedback loop on what we heard from the public health um, advisory committee as far as feedback um, on these fees and then the follow-up information um, that there was uh, uh, relative just to the fluctuation in revenues and expenditures um, for environmental health. Commissioner Willie? So what when were you expecting, when can we expect this to come back? Because what I want to communicate is, um, I appreciate the information. I just need a little bit more. I think you'll get you'll get a unanimous vote out of this group once we, Nafisa and I, kind of get our follow-up so, questions. So 
we want to say we're supportive of you. So I will be directing staff to prepare the budget with a hundred uh, 95, 90%, do I have the percent, those options, and then we can, at least then we can pull on what lever the board wants to make for the final recommendation. Similarly, um, LUT will be building with a fee increase. Um, however, to get to a final proposed budget, that's why we want to get back before your board with final thumbs up sometime, ideally February, but um, I haven't circled back with the team on the exact date. Well, I just want to clarify, make I don't want them to do a bunch more work for the 95 and the 90 if we're all going to say 100. We we have mechanics worked out behind the scenes okay. on this. We already talked about it prior to They've got enough things conversation. To do. We don't need to be adding to it when we know we're probably going to end up at 100. So however that works for you. I thought the chair said the majority was 400. And so you got the thumb. If this is something that, Nafisa, we need to be unanimous on. So uh, I just, I'm, I'm sure that you're going to get your questions answered as am I. I'm just communicating that message to them that we're going to get to unanimous on this. It's not going to be three, two. We may. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. That brings us to the end of our work session agenda topics. Was there anything else that may have come up? Okay, seeing none, we're adjourned. Done.